At Gillisons, we design, manufacture, repair, deliver, and retail rugged, high-tech machines to make your operation successful. As a family-built business, we have your family's best interest at heart. Gillisons Variety Fabrication, manufacturers of quality farm equipment since 1977. I'm Patrick Connor with the University of Georgia Horticulture Department. I'm a professor and I work in the Tifton campus and the focus of my research is developing new pecan tree cultivars for the Georgia industry. So we do a lot of breeding and testing of our varieties and selections as well as other varieties that come from other programs. What we're in today is the University of Georgia Ponder Farm variety trial. This is a test where we test new selections and, and varieties and compare them to standard cultivars. We collect that data over many years and then we give that data to the growers so they can decide which cultivars will work best in their operation. So we take a lot of different data in this orchard throughout the year. In the spring we start with bud break and we come in and rate twice a week when the buds are breaking and when they get to the parachute stage and that helps us know uh, which varieties might be best for the colder regions of the state because if you have a later bud break you tend to skip and miss some of the frost. So if you have a cultivar like Elliott that breaks bud very early in the season, it's more susceptible to spring frost. And so is not as usable in the northern part of the state. After bud break, we come in and look at bloom data. So again, we walk it every two times a week and we look at pollen shed, and then we look at pistol receptivity. And we use that to get our pollination charts so that we know what cultivars are best at pollinating other cultivars. Uh, and then we come in somewhere in the summer after the first and second drop and we look at cluster size. So we take 20 nut clusters around the tree and we count the number of nuts in each cluster. And that cluster data gives us an idea how more likely it is a cultivar is going to alternate bare. If you have on average over three nuts per cluster, you're probably going to alternate bare unless you shake some of that crop off. Ideally, if you're not going to shake the crop off, we like to see about two and a half nuts per cluster. So that means half your clusters would have about two nuts and half would have three nuts. That number of nuts per cluster is generally sustainable long term without shaking the crop. And now in this time of year, so in August, late August, we come in and rate pest resistance of the trees. So we go down the trees and I rate leaf scab, nut scab, black aphid damage on the tree, and sooty mold buildup. The way we manage this orchard is similar to a commercial orchard, although we use a fewer fungicide sprays than is normally recommended. And we do that because we have some scab resistant trees out here and we want to see what their level of scab resistance is. If we sprayed everything like we sprayed, we would want to spray desirable, uh, we're likely not to get much scab on cultivars which have moderate levels of resistance. Um, and so we've gone actually in the newer plantings and now we're re removing desirable because it's too scab susceptible. When we spray like we're spraying and desirable, we lose the crop and so it doesn't make a good test tree. So now we're moving to using Sumner and Creek as our standard cultivars because they have a higher level of resistance. So after we get that data, we all come in uh, late September, October, again walk it twice a week and look at shut split data. Uh, and we um, evaluate that, we count how many nuts are open and how many are closed each of those times and then we find the the date that 50% of the nuts are open. And although this isn't when you would shake them to harvest, it's the best date in terms of giving it to compare one variety to another to see how early they are. Then we'll come in and we have a crew and we harvest each individual tree and get the yield data from that tree. And then we take a 50 nut sample and we take the 50 nut sample into the lab. We run it through a commercial type cracker. We shell it out and we get the data for nut size and percent kernel. And then we grade the kernels and we're looking at things like the shelling ability, how many whole halves we get. We look at kernel color, uh, the amount of fuzz or packing tissue that's sticking to the kernel, and just and overall how nice the kernel is. And so we take all that data, we accumulate it, and then we present it at various meetings 
and we also have it on our website and then growers can use that information to decide which cultivars they maybe want to plant in their orchard and we don't have enough data to really definitively say which trees yield the best uh, but we do have enough data to say those that are going to overbear are going to need crop thinning those which probably aren't going to yield enough uh, we're fairly good at being able to weed out varieties which have no place in Georgia orchards before people waste their time and money planting them in those orchards. The ones that make it through that screening process then Lenny and I recommend for trial so we can see them around the state and see how well they're doing in the state. And when they start doing well in a large number of different grower orchards then we recommend them fully for everybody to plant on a more wide scale. So if you want some of that data and what we're recommending currently and, and how things are looking come to our website and that data will be presented there. Now what I'm gonna do is focus on three newer cultivars that have been put out and we'll look at the strengths and weaknesses of those cultivars and how they're looking in the variety test so far. First cultivar we're gonna talk about is Avalon. Avalon was released from my breeding program uh, three or four years ago now. It was released as a very highly scab resistant cultivar for use in Georgia orchards. So far, Avalon has performed quite well for us in our variety trial. We top worked Avalon trees in 2009. So now the trees have grown back and you really can't tell that they've been top worked. We look at yield in a Tifton trial on these top work trees. Uh, and for, we took the yield from the last five years when the trees were fairly full sized. And this is a 40 by 40 foot planting. And we averaged the last five years, 93 pounds per tree on Avalon. In general, Avalon is a very regular bearing and fairly high bearing cultivar. It averages two and a half nuts per cluster, which is exactly what we want to see for a cultivar, which we're not going to be doing a lot of crop thinning on. In general, the yields have gone up each year. Year 10, it was 69 pounds on average. Year 11 went up to 85 pounds. 12 was 75 pounds. Year 13 was 111 pounds. And last year was 125 pounds on average per the tree. We have a little bit less crop on the trees this year, but we still have a decent crop on them, even with that high um, crop load last year. Uh, we've averaged 47 nuts per pound and 54% kernel on these, these nuts. So they're not super large and they're not super high quality like some of the newer cultivars. But in terms of a scab resistant tree, they're good size for scab resistant tree and they're good enough quality to sell well in the marketplace. When we looked at these trees, uh, untop work trees, just gr newly grafted trees, we do a trial in Ray City. Uh, and there on year six, we had 35 pounds, year seven, 57 pounds, and year eight, 68 pounds per tree in that trial, which is very high yielding for young trees. And part of the reason that they're so high yielding is the tree is a very vigorous tree and grows much quicker. Desirable on those three years, we had 10, nine, and 19 pounds per tree. And so when you look at the Avalon trees and compare them to the desirable trees, the Avalon trees are just growing much larger than are the desirable trees. Um, Zinner was in that trial as well, and it averaged 32 pounds uh, per year compared to the 53 of Avalon. And so Zinner is actually a very good growing tree. And so that's a little bit more what we would expect a yield on young trees to be. But Avalon again, seems to be a quite good bearer, both as a young tree and as a mature tree. This is a 14 year old Avalon tree. As you can see, it's growing quite well. Uh, it, it is a vigorous tree. Crop load is moderate this year, mostly ones, twos, and threes, and nuts per cluster. Uh, last year, this tree had 150 pounds on it. And so this year, it's a little bit less of a crop load, but pretty good for this size tree coming back from that large of a crop. Uh, in this orchard, we, and it's in the spray schedule it is, we've never seen scab on this tree, either on the leaves or on the nuts. We see a little bit of moderate black aphid damage, and that is something you have to watch a little bit on Avalon. It tends to be somewhat more preferred by black aphids. Not as bad as an Oconee, but similar to like a Caddo. Uh, the other things have been, we usually harvest this in the first week of October. So it's coming off ahead of Desirable, but not early like something like Pawnee. Uh, moderate size, 47 nuts per pound. A good 54% kernel. Yields have been good. We think this is an all around good tree for Georgia orchards. It's especially useful for people in the lower part of the state that have trouble controlling scab or for growers that cannot get over their acreage and spray it as much as they would like to for scab control.
Second variety we're looking at today is Lakota. Lakota was released out of the USDA breeding program. And it was released primarily, or at least when it first came out, for the northern pecan region. And that's because it's an early variety with a fairly large nut for an early variety. Uh, and it had some cold resistance from its, one of its parents, Major, which is a common cultivar in the northern pecan region. But because it was early and showing good scab resistance, we decided to trial it to see if it might have usefulness in Georgia orchards. Because right now, we really don't have something that's harvested in September uh, with very high levels of scab resistance. Lakota has held up its scab resistance. I've never seen scab on it in, in South Georgia. And so that part of it looks good. Uh, it's a very vigorous tree, but its biggest problem right now is it's alternating already as a young tree. When you look at this tree, you can tell it had some damage to it. Uh, it's missing a lot of limbs up in the top of the tree. Uh, and it's because two years ago, it had a very high yield, uh, averaging about 80 pounds on these trees, which was too much crop load for that. And it just broke out a lot of limbs. And the quality was severely compromised in that high crop year. Last year, it had basically nothing on any of our Lakota trees. Uh, and then this year again, they're getting into a heavy crop cycle. So that means we're going to have to crop thin the Lakota for it to be a successful cultivar in Georgia. I think if we do crop thin it successfully, I think it can be a useful cultivar. Uh, on the good years, we're getting 55 nuts per pound and 56% kernel. I've seen it a little bit bigger than that. I think it could be bigger than the 55 nuts per pound if you crop thin it a little more uh, appropriately. Uh, and the kernels generally look good if they're not overcropped. If you overcrop them, the kernels start veining and getting dark. And so that's another reason to control that crop load. It's a type 2 tree, uh, which is useful because it's one of the few type 2 trees that can be, that has an early harvest in September. Most of our other early cultivars like Pawnee and Bird and Treadwell are all type 1s. And so this might be a useful pollinator for an early culture, uh, for an early harvest orchard. We're getting about 50% shuck split on September 28th. So you're going to be harvesting end of September, uh, maybe first week of October at the latest. Now let's move in and look a little bit at the clusters of Lakota and why it's having so much trouble with the alternate bearing. This is the problem with Lakota in terms of alternate bearing. It just sets too many nuts per cluster. You see this cluster has six nuts, got another cluster with four nuts, cluster up here has five nuts. So on average, this tree is giving 3.6 nuts per cluster. And that's taking the on and off years and averaging them together. And the on year, it's four nuts per cluster. And so that means you're having a lot of five and six nut per cluster um, terminals. And that's too many for the tree to, to sustain. It gives you overall too much crop load, giving you the alternate bearing. But it also gives another thing that we've seen in Lakota, which is variable nut size. We have some nuts which are fairly large and they'll be mixed in on the same tree with nuts that are a fair degree smaller than that. And I think that's probably because you have so many nuts per cluster. Some of the nuts get fed well through the stem, but other nuts do not have as good of a connection, don't get as much water and nutrients, and don't size up the way they should, making them more variable. And so that is overall why we need a lower number of, uh, or we need more thinning on this tree to successfully grow in Georgia. If you're not going to crop thin, do not plant Lakota, you will not be successful growing it. But if you are going to crop thin it, I think it does have some potential in some orchards. The third gold of our we're going to talk about this morning is Tom. Tom was released by Daryl Sparks, who was also in the horticulture department at the University of Georgia, and did some pecan breeding. It's probably the release of his that's generated the most enthusiasm from various growers. And the reason for that is it's kind of a dwarfy tree. If you're familiar with Cheyenne, you know Cheyenne's a smaller tree, about two thirds of the size of, peca of a normal pecan. Tom is similar to Cheyenne, but a little bit even smaller. It usually is one half to two thirds the size of a standard growing pecan tree. Despite being small, it has fairly good yields and it has a good quality nut. Uh, we're getting about 58 nuts per pound, a 55% kernel out of it, which is pretty good for that size of a pecan. It's from a Wichita by Pawnee cross and it does have some need to be sprayed with fungicide, but when we do spray it with fungicides, a uh, scab has been well controlled on it. The biggest enthusiasm for this cultivar is from growers wanting to plant high density orchards and not have to thin them or hedge them as quickly as you would a standard cultivar. 
And so for this, Tom seems to be an ideal tree. You would plant it closer together uh, and come in and try and get early yields, heavy early yields from that. Uh, when it was released, it was thought maybe it could be a replacement for Elliott. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than Elliott, higher percent kernel than Elliott, and comes into production sooner than Elliott. However, it does not have the high level of scab resistance that an Elliott tree has. Elliott probably does not need fungicides to be grown successfully. Tom does need to be sprayed with fungicides to be grown successfully. So if you're looking at planting a high density orchard, and you want a tree that's a little bit smaller to maybe fit into that and to experiment with, uh, Tom is a good tree to try in that situation. With over 150 years of being owned and operated, the Hudson family proudly brings you quality pecans from the heart of pecan country. In addition to pecan production, the Hudson family provides custom agricultural systems, pecan orchard design, tree moving, and installation. Hudson Pecan Company, dedicated to quality. At Valent, we're committed to helping you take the next step toward your goals through sustainable agricultural solutions and practices. With our shared purpose to increase productivity and feed an ever-growing population, we're with you every step of the way. Valent, here to help you grow. Hello everybody, it is with great pleasure to introduce effects of foliar applications of zinc and nickel nanofertilizers and zinc and nickel sulfate on pecan plant physiology. My name is Dr. Christina Pisani. I am the research horticulturist with the USDA ARS Southeast Fruit and Tree Nut Research Laboratory in Byron, Georgia. This project is in collaboration with Dr. Lorenzo Rossi, uh, University of Florida Indian River Research and Education Center in Fort Pierce, Florida, and Dr. Christopher Hendrickson, Director of Research and Development for Aqua Yield in Draper, Utah. The main objective of the project is to determine if the canopy exposure to nanoparticles, in particular zinc and nickel nanoparticles, can improve the health and longevity of pecan tree canopies. Macro and micronutrients are critical to maximize tree health. Microelements are very important for fruit set and retention and for fruit yield and quality. Zinc and nickel, in particular, are the two microelements that would be dealt with in this. What is nanotechnology? Nano, meaning one billionth, are materials that are smaller than 100 nanometers. Nanofertilizers are being studied as a way to increase nutrient efficiency and improve plant nutrition. It has been shown that nanofertilizers can deliver micronutrients gradually and more effectively. Zinc nanoparticles have been used already uh, on a variety of different crops, such as peanut, beans and soybean, tomato, cotton, maize, coffee, and pomegranate. However, uh, we have not seen the use of nano uh, nanofertilizers on pecan. And nickel nanoparticles uh, or nanofertilizers have not been used on any crop. In any. Zinc is a very important nutrient in pecan. Pecan has a high zinc requirement. It is critical to the growth and not development of pecans. It is also crucial in the improvement of fruit set growth and yield. The efficiency of zinc is a major problem in acidic soils in the southeast United States and in high pH calcareous soils of the southwest United States. Zinc deficiency leaves, uh, leads to a condition known as rosette or little leaf, which was first identified in 1932. It exhibits itself with short internodes, it inhibits shoot elongation. It usually leads to small, often chlorotic leaflets with many waved, wavy margins. In order to correct the zinc deficiency, spring foliar applications on leaves uh, as they're expanding are very important. This is before symptoms appear, which then becomes irreversible. Nickel is, a, is an essential microelement in plants. In pecan, it causes nickel deficiency, causes a condition known as mouse ear. It exhibits itself at small roundish leaflets or blunt leaflet tips, as shown in the pictures on the right. The trees get dwarfing, uh, there's dwarfing of tree organs and necrosis of leaf, leaf, leaflet tip. It's very common in newly transplanted trees in established orchards and it usually appears on spring growth flush. 
So the reason and the way to correct um, nickel deficiency is foliar sprays in the spring when the leaves are in parachute stage or the small um, small uh, stage. And also an additional application in the fall for prevention of uh, nickel deficiency the following spring. You want to also avoid application of uh, excessive application of uh, zinc because it complete it competes with the uh, and inhibits the nickel uptake. And you also want to manage other nutrients like phosphorus, iron, and copper in the soil because they also can affect the uptake of nickel. So it's a balance between all macro and micro elements. The objectives of the project is to aim to understand more about the physiological responses of pecan and the uptake of micronutrients in pecan plants in response to conventional foliar applications or foliar applications of nanoparticles with the two essential micronutrients. So we wanted to compare physiological responses of pecan to zinc salt conventional fertilizers and zinc nano fertilizer and also compare physiological responses of pecan to nickel salt fertilizer and nickel nano fertilizer. The way we set up the experiment is a uh, greenhouse pot experiment. We use two cultivars of pecan, Caria ilionensis, cultivars Zinner and Bird. That we use two-year-old bare root science grafted onto Elliott seedling rootstock. We had five fertilization treatments. One was zinc sulfate at 25 milligrams per liter, zinc sulfate and sulfate with the nanoparticle carrier, also 25 milligrams per liter, nickel sulfate, 10 milligrams per liter, nickel sulfate with a nanoparticle carrier at 10 milligrams per liter, and the untreated control water or no fertilization. Nickel and zinc treatments were applied every 14 days for five applications beginning at the parachute stage of the spring bud break in the greenhouse using a handheld sprayer. Foliar applications were applied at the start of the experiment, which we labeled T0, and to, uh, uh, following um, two-week intervals up to 69 days post-initial uh, spray at T5. Our variables, we looked at the photosynthetic uh, parameters. This we used, uh, we did using a LICOR, a portable instrument called the LICOR 6800 photosynthetic meter. We looked at gas, using this meter, we, used, we looked at gas exchange variables such as net carbon assimilation rate, transpiration rate, and stomatoconductance to water vapor. And we also looked at the fluorescence FeO4 FM ratio. We, at the end, at the uh, at 69th day, we, collect, we, we collected data on chlorophyll content using SPAD 502 plus meter. We also collected fresh weight and dry weight of leaves. And um, zinc and nickel con uh, content accumulation into the leaves was assessed using an ICPMS instrument. Data was then subjected to analysis of variance by completely randomized design. This is what we observed in the first year of our study, that nickel and zinc nanoparticles did not influence fresh weight of leaves on either cultivar, uh, bird, and zinner. That can be seen in, uh, in figures A and B. The dry weight was also not affected by the treatments in each cultivars, and that is observed in figures C and D. We looked at the zinc nanoparticles treated leaves that contained higher amounts of zinc for cultivar bird when compared to traditional zinc fertilized treated leaves, even though they were not significantly different from zinner or other treatments. That is in figure A. And figure B shows that nickel nanoparticle treated leaves contain significantly higher amounts of nickel, about 5.07 milligrams per kilograms of dry weight for cultivar zinner and 7.07 .07 milligrams per kilograms dry weight for cultivar bird when compared to nickel um, sulfate treated leaves with a conventional fertilizer. That is observed in figure B. In terms of the SPAD reading or chlorophyll content of nickel treated plants was highest in the control at 43.06 reading and, uh, and nickel uh, conventional nickel treated plants with, with a reading of 41.87 of cultivar bird.
when it comes to photosynthetic parameters, the net photosynthetic rate was generally higher in nickel-treated nano-fertilized zener plants, except net carbon assimilation uh, rate for zinc-treated plants, and that it was not significantly different than the uh, untreated control. The same thing can be observed for cultivar bird, but for zinc treat, uh, zinc zinc uh, conventional zinc fertilized plants or higher, a uh, transpiration rate was higher, and as well as tomato conduct. Other conclusions, we can say that differences for leaf area were also observed among the two cultivars of nickel treated and zinc treated plants. Overall, the nickel nanoparticles were more easily absorbed into the leaf than regular nickel fertilizers for both cultivars, and nickel nanoparticles showed a positive impact on gas exchange parameters, such as transpiration rate and stomatoconductance of the plants of the cultivar zinner. This project aims at developing new orchard management tools for fertilization. Nanoparticles could potentially replace or supplement traditional salt-based fertilizers. Nanofertilizers can deliver micronutrients more gradually, more efficiently, and potentially reducing costs by minimizing losses of the actual fertilizer to the surrounding soil and minimizing potential pollution and environmental risks. Due to their efficiency, the use of nanotechnology may be more cost-effective compared to traditional fertilization and could be very applicable in pecan. This was a preliminary study for first year in the greenhouse. We want to follow up the study with a second year with uh, seedlings that we're going to grow from seed of uh, seeds that we have available for cultivar Stuart and Elliot. We've observed uh, background um, uh, zinc in control plants. So since these plants uh, had already uh, been grown by a grower, um, they were probably uh, initially fertilized with zinc. Uh, we want to, uh, if the second year uh, study, uh, it also gives uh, some promising results. We want to move the study to mature uh, trees out in the field. And if that also shows positive uh, results, we will consider uh, stud uh, following up with an economic study to see if uh, fertilizers, conventional fertilizers can be either replaced or supplement it with a, nanopart a nanoparticle fertilizer, at least for the two micronutrients that we're using in this study. I want to say thank you. I want to, uh, you to please stay tuned for year two study results. And if you have any questions, I am open. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm Andrew Sawyer, area pecan agent for Southeast Georgia, and my role is to work with growers and county agents in areas of Southeast Georgia with pecan management and also work with specialists on research and education as well. Disease management of young trees like you see behind me and also insect management and some things that we've learned from this year. But I'm going to start with disease management on young trees. Now, when we look at all of our pecans and all of our cultivars, we categorize them as high input, medium input, and low input. So the low input cultivars are ones that are very disease resistant. Dr. Wells has already covered a lot of aspects of these low input cultivars that I'm referring to. In terms of fungicide and in terms of management, though we don't see scab, uh, if at all, on these cultivars, we still will have some kind of program of managing fungicide for these trees. There are other disease that these trees can get. So we still will recommend three fungicides a year on low input cultivars. 
and the use of fungicides that work really good on leaf scab uh, we feel like would be good for these cultivars such as phosphites and group threes and group 11s so you know doing a doing a treatment at the end of april early may and then end of june early july and then toward the end of the season and in august would be would be good for these low input trees one of the most common questions is what do we do with medium input or high input trees in terms of scab and disease management when they are young like what you see behind me that is a very common question and our current recommendations are that most fungicide is not going to need to be used in this early growth like you see behind me and simply because right now is mostly inconsequential since it's leaf scab a high input cultivar like desirable we will see scab build up on it pretty bad especially for year four or five phosphites and group threes and group elevens that do good on leaf scab is what we need to think about so what we did out here was we took a phosphite fungicide which does good on leaf scab and also translocates well in the tree well, what we did on these trees behind me was we took a phosphite and we use different rates and different intervals to treat to see if we had difference in scab for these young trees. The trees behind me are Caddo and they are two years old. They are getting scab, but it's not severe right now by any means. So at this orchard, what we did was we used k and treated at four quarts per acre every three weeks four quarts per acre every six weeks and then two quarts per acre every three weeks and two quarts per acre every six weeks sometimes at high rates uh, we will do see a little scorch or burn on the leaves from the phosphite and so as you look at these trees here you can see that it is evident and especially on trees that had high rates at shorter intervals this tree here was treated with four quarts per acre every three weeks. These are two year old trees, so scab is not as severe this early. But even on a cultivar that's highly susceptible, you know, we may or may not see difference. So this is something that I think is gonna be beneficial for us to look at. I think we also need to look at it on different varieties, like such as Pawnee, which will get scab real heavy and see that we see any difference. But one thing you can see, here's a control right here, and you can see that there's a little bit of scab on the tree. However, when you look at other trees that have been treated, you virtually see no scab. So we do see that there's something. But for the difference, we're putting a lot of the phosphite on there that you can see is gonna burn the trees. That was fungicide on young trees, but I also wanna point out some things that we've learned on insect management for young trees this year. The last two years we've had a high pressure from bud moth. This year I really feel like we did a good job controlling bud moth and staying on top of it and I actually think a lot of it was due to how bad the damage was in 2019. This year we did a lot better with bud moth but I've been seeing damage that are similar to bud moth and I want to show you the difference and it's not but it's called hickory shoot curculio bud moth what it'll do is it'll start by feeding on those leaves and it stays in that caterpillar stage for about two weeks but then what it does is it'll actually bore into the stem when the caterpillar hatches it stays at caterpillar about two weeks and then it'll start webbing toward the end of that and they can bore in the shoot which will kill the terminal and that's what is really damaging to these young trees. But a hickory shoot curculio, which is a weevil, will get in also bores into these shoots. It is a more random pest and it does not have the five or six generations that a bud moth has. But the way we tell the difference is we slice into the stem and the tunnel from a hickory shoot curculio will be a lot longer than it will be for a bud moth. Bottom line for hickory shoot curculio, we don't recommend treating because they don't have many life cycles and they are very random in the way that they attack. 
but bud moth on the other hand is very damaging and that's why noting that difference is important another thing is the damage that we see from deer browsing and deer browsing and bud moth can also look very similar so one of the biggest differences to look for is with bud moth when you have severe damage the leaves will be attached to the tree but they'll be dead okay but with deer browsing a lot of times those leaves are completely chewed off all the way back to the bud and the bud will still be trying to come out so you may see some of that necrosis on the buds however when the leaves are remaining on the tree and dying that's still from bud moth so obviously both have to be treated but both are different in management so it is important to know what you have but for bud moth we have to stay on it a lot of questions that we get from growers is how long is intrepid gonna last versus dimlin in different environments they actually can last different amounts of time so what we do know is that there's a difference in how those are absorbed into the plant so Manecto Pro is absorbed into the plant and it actually translocates and moves within that stem intrepid edge is absorbed into the plant but it doesn't move in the same for intrepid uh, dimlin is more or less on the plant but not as much absorbed and the the caterpillar has to feed to ingest that so ambrosia beetles are first and then bud moth is going to come at bud break and then after bud moth we may have some random and odd feeding from different pests and one thing i want to take and show you is feeding from caterpillars gregorius caterpillars like walnut caterpillar so this can occur in young trees and it can occur in large mature trees. But it's on young trees that we probably have to watch it a little bit more because obviously the tree doesn't have as many leaves and it'll take all the leaves off this tree. As you can see from this tree here, these caterpillars have taken off everything off this tree. And here's what the walnut caterpillar looks like. And what we need to know is that walnut caterpillars and fall webworms, they have two generations a year and this walnut caterpillar unlike fall webworm it's not going to make a web and stay in that web it's actually going to go up and down that tree every day and uh, of course they're going to pupate in the ground and we can do a quick knockdown on these uh, with lores band but we could also use something like an insect growth regulator like dimlin or intrepid and such to use on these trees Good morning. I'm Brad Ellis, president of the U.S. Pecan Growers Council. The clips are falling are cracking, the crows are singing, and it's time to start shaking this crop on the few lands we have left. The USPGC has worked on behalf of the U.S. pecan industry, the shellers, the growers, the accumulators, and overseas markets since 2010. Our mission is to educate, promote, and to help market U.S. pecans. USPGC has developed a marketing strategy focused on educating consumers related to the health attributes of pecans connecting exporters with overseas buyers, and introducing our commodity to many foreign countries, some that have never even tasted pecans. Janice will show you in a moment 
where we have spent all of our efforts to help the world see the benefits of pecans that we all grow and enjoy. When the tariff slowed sales in China, we were able to make great strides in 2019 in other countries like South Korea, Thailand, and Vietnam, develop new markets with our ATP funds. Now that MAP funds are handled through the APC and the International Committee, our role has changed. They are concentrated on Germany and the United Kingdom with half of the MAP funds, and we're to, in charge of handling the China and the Southeast Asia markets. With COVID shutting down travel and the committee decided in mid-July to change our direction and hire a new marketing firm, Weber Shannon, to do more market analysis in China, we're continuing our social media and awareness campaigns to keep U.S. pecans in the minds of people all over. For when the politics and pandemic give us a break, and we get back to normal. Good luck to the growers across the Pecan Belt, and I pray that we all dodge the hurricanes and the bad weather, and I wish everybody a bountiful harvest as we go into this fall. Good morning. I want to give you some information, uh, as Brad said, on our promotions for this 2019 year. Normally do this at the meeting in uh, March with uh, Georgia, but since COVID came, all that changed. So let me give you some information. In 2019, we were in four different markets, South Korea, China, Vietnam, and in 2020, we will be working through the American Pecan Council, uh, through the Market Access Funds, through China, but we will also have the Agricultural Trade Funds in 2020 that will we'll be directly working in Korea, China, and other Southeast Asia. This is our USPGC funding source by year. I think it's very interesting to see when we started in 2010 how much money we received each year through USDA Foreign Ag Service. We also took advantage of a lot of other programs that are available through USDA as the Quality Sample Program, the Global Broad Based Initiative, which is a program through um, private brands such as Ocean Spray. We did that a couple of times in China and in India. And also, also the EMP. The EMP program is Emerging Markets, which gives you funding to be able to do research in those markets to find out where your product might fit. So if you'll look down at the bottom, in 2019, we were awarded that $1.3 million from the Agricultural Trade Program, and we have three years to use those funds, and that is to help us fund alternate markets into China. And then in 2020, we received funds from APC through the MAP program of $316,000. This slide shows you the U.S. Pecan Growers funding through the American Pecan Council by year. As you well know, the federal marketing order was put in in late uh, 2016. And each year we receive funding from American Pecan Council, uh, usually by the mid year. Our funding year uh, through the market access programs has always been January through December. So it was always a little bit late getting us started, but we proceeded on. And in 2020, you know, we received money from APC, half of the MAP allocation for 2020. This was done in August. It's $316,000. And USPGC is under contract with American Pecan Council to manage Southeast Asia, actually China, for $165,000. So let me give you some information on the 2019 programs we did. Okay, so in 2019, the social media programs in China, we did a lot of the platforms that are very popular in China from WeChat, Weibo, TikTok, there's several others. These comparatively to the ones in the U.S. that you're familiar with as Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. Uh, in 2019, we did several media platforms. Um, we actually have our own WeChat account and we, through our cooperator, we did some on her account. We had a lot of um, different views and through all the channels, we ended up with 44 million over 770,000 different views of our products um, on, on social media. We've also worked with the key opinion leaders, the KOL Woody. He did a spring festival video for us. He's the founder of Shing Flavor, which has had over 760,000 Weibo and over 20,000 WeChat followers. He's very popular. We're going to post this video just for time's sake up on our website uh, a little bit later, but uh, he's a, actually a very well-known um, these are a couple of snapshots from those, these girls at the top. You probably have your own children or grandchildren who are very uh, familiar with following somebody. Maybe it's the Kardashians, maybe it's someone else. But these young ladies are have a lot of followings, and it may be from my style, maybe from eating, uh, just different things they do. So we solicited with them to get them to work with us and put up a few different comments about pecans and how healthy they were and how they ate them and things like that. 
Uh, the bottom uh, bottom right of the slide shows you uh, a sweet potato ball that was created on the video from uh, Woody. And it was a video that ran through Spring Festival. It actually had the recipe out there. It was pretty neat. It was actually talking about family and things that are very familiar to us also here in the States. So it's a very good medium to be able to use to get our message out. Uh, so we continue to do that. We not only put information about pecans as far as um, the taste and things like that, but we also talk about the history, um, the storage tips, just other things that would intrigue or, you know, get somebody involved or interested in looking into more and more about what our product has. Um, we've got a couple of other videos we did uh, during the Spring Festival. Again, this is the URL, but you're welcome to go and actually look at the video. We just, for time's sake, did not want to uh, put it up here on the screen today. Okay, this gives you a summary of the 2019 social media we had uh, actually in China last year. We actually worked with um, the WeChat post, we did Weibo post, we did social media on TikTok. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about TikTok in the news lately. It's a um, short video clip that is put out there around the world and uh, it's very very popular here in the U.S. right now. We did a couple of little short videos of the Cranberry Marketing and a couple of other accounts and we received quite a bit of clicks and likes and even comments through it. Uh, we've done a couple of videos through it so it's a very good medium for us to get our message out to consumers. We also work with the Daogu who is a huge recipe collection um, site. It's kind of like uh, all recipes here in the U.S. if you're looking for you know, a pecan pie recipe or a pecan salad, you'll go to these different sites. And we actually worked through a recipe demonstration with him, and it had over 3 million likes, as you can see. So it's very popular, and we've done this a couple of times during the year, and it's been very successful. And above the major uh, social channels, we've done videos, we've done recipes that have been generated. So we've been very busy through Daigu, Tencent Video, and others. So we've done real well with social media, and it continues to be a platform that we can uh, talk about our product and, and the, the health benefits and the versatility. USPGC has participated in several trade shows over the years in China. One of the ones that we have engaged in the last couple of years was Bakery China. Uh, we have a huge booth there with pecan products that were made by local bakeries uh, for us to sample. Uh, this is one of the sections that we felt in the market that we could actually do a lot of good. There are bakeries in China, um, about every third or fourth storefront is a bakery. Uh, most Chinese do not have ovens in their homes, so they go by their local bakery to get breads or tarts or different kinds of things they want to do. Uh, we thought this was an area of the market that we could actually expand upon and going forward. Just to give you an idea, we did a live streaming in, back in Seattle in 2018, and we were showing a pecan brownie, a pecan salad. And there was over 6 million views just during that section of, of, the, of the show. So obviously these are still um, events that we need to continue on. And hopefully when the COVID goes away, we'll be able to participate in it. Okay, moving forward, let's go into South Korea's 2019 projects. In 2019, as you can see on the screen, there were multiple bags created specifically for pecans in these different ultra hyper markets from E-Mart, e -Mart Traders, Hyundai. They would bring in products, uh, kernels in bulk and reprocess them and put them into their own bags. So we picked up a lot of recognition in these stores with them having their own uh, branded bag. This slide gives you several photos of hypermarkets that we were doing in-store sampling. You know, this would be in Kim's Club or E-Mart, possibly Hyundai, Lotte, Home Plus. Many of the retailers really encourage the in-store sampling. They feel like that it gives the consumer uh, a taste of what they're buying, obviously, but also encourages sales and also encourages our sales. So you'll notice that the ladies giving out product have on our aprons that say U.S. Pecan, so the consumer knows that they are buying a U.S. Pecan product. Again, this has been super successful. I think this has driven probably a lot of the sales that we've had over the last 24 to 36 months, and we plan on continuing these projects. 
Just to give you a, a snapshot into the four-year growth increase in sales, this will show you from um, 2015 all the way to 2019, the imports, imports by month from the USA. And at the end of the year of 2019, if you'll look in the bottom left hand, excuse me, bottom right hand corner, you'll see we were up 41.87% growth um, just from 18 to 19. So we were super excited and we knew the projects we were doing were actually uh, hitting home and we were driving consumption. One of the items that we felt like we needed to do in Korea was to do a consumer and industry survey. We needed to create benchmarks so we knew as we're going forward what were the key components of the, the, the industry, where were we had growth potentials and where we didn't. So we focused on five different measurements of a total of 1,000 consumers and they responded in the last quarter of 2019. And you can look there at the five different items from awareness to trial, preference, acceptance. We also went a step further and we did the industry industry survey and had four measurements there and there was a total of 11 importers and three uh, retailers and they all responded to the survey but again we were looking at the preference retailers uh, acceptance and um, just getting some information from them to see what we could do to help them and to create more uh, more sales into South Korea this is the results of the benchmark. If you look on the left hand side of the screen, it's the consumer survey and you'll see the five questions that they were asked and we have a 19 benchmark there. Awareness, there were 64% of the people who are aware of pecans. Awareness of the health benefits, there were 62.9. Um, people who had tried or purchased pecans are at 63% and people who had preferred pecans to other tree nuts were at 25.5 and then pecans who, people who are purchasing pecans at least once a month were at 10 so obviously there are some goals that we need to set for ourselves for 2020, 21, and 22 to increase each one of these. And so we have a, uh, a trend moving up and in going into 2020 and 2021 and further, we hope to be able to increase these numbers and actually meet our goal. On the right hand side, you see the industry survey, it's the performance measures and it's talking about the U.S. Um, you know, importer where they bought pecans versus other tree nuts. You see the benchmark for 19. Retailers who prefer pecans to other tree nuts, again you see the benchmark is 67% and percent of importers who are buying pecans throughout the year and then those who are buying from major hypermarket chains selling pecans throughout the year. And you see those last two, we actually had 100% which means pecan importers and retailers in South Korea are buying pecans all through the year. They're not buying them at holiday times or just, you know, one or two months of the year. They're actually buying pecans throughout the year. So with 53 million plus people in Korea, we feel like the dollars we have spent has absolutely been a success and we want to continue to grow this market. You'll also see we set ourselves some benchmarks for 2021 and 22. And again, we hope to continue our promotions so that we can actually try to make these, these goals we've set for ourselves. Okay, in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam, we have also tried the in-store promotions of Vietnam. People do shop there quite frequently in stores versus online. There's a huge Korean influence in Vietnam and we felt like that, that might give us a little heads up so that you see people who have family in Korea and they're talking about different things and that's maybe be one of the conversation topics they're discussing. So we've tried that and it's worked okay. Uh, out that uh, you know depending on the market you're in as far as the the, the the actual location of the store and if you look here here's the top 10 that we did we did in Lotte's we did in Big C's and uh, Coop Extras in the different cities so you know we've got a pretty good idea of what was happening one of the um, goals we were trying to do is, is to work with a company who also has factories in four or five different other countries. Their main factory is actually in Bangkok, Thailand. It's a company called Heritage, and they do a lot of um, packaging with nuts. They're a huge um, uh, importer of nuts all over the world going into there, and they actually uh, create packaging and put out. One of their customers you may know is Trader Joe's. So you may be familiar with that in the States. But we had some goals. What we aimed to do was to talk about the good benefits and application of pecans. We had a lot of uh, insights and you know, responses of people who were you know, taking the pecans. What do they think about them? We had a lot of customer feedback. And it's still a relatively new tree nut in the market. So we've got a lot of space there to actually grow the market. And in general, you know, pecans work well, but they are still expensive to a lot of the, the local um, vendors in that location and consumers. It's just a a pricing up for them. 
2019 for Turkey. This was the last year we were in Turkey just from funding sources. We had to make a decision, and Turkey was one of the ones. We have participated in a uh, coffee festival over the years. It's been very successful. Uh, these are outdoor festivals that are super popular. This one's in Istanbul. And uh, we uh, pair pecans with coffee. And two of the things that have been surprisingly a good ingredients together, they've actually done really well. So we hope at one time, at some time, to go back into Turkey. I thought it's a great in-shell market. And we just did not have enough uh, funding to really move forward and, and uh, do the things we need to do. But Turkey is actually still on my radar. I think it's a great, great opportunity. We participated with the Dream Academy. There was a, it's an academy that's full of um, chefs. It's like a chef academy. And they were creating dishes. This is a, a few of the ones that you'll see. And one of the ones that was doing was a crate and barrel. You see on the bottom left hand of your screen, you'll notice that. They created a for them. And they also created a cookbook. And so they had pretty sophisticated type recipes, things that were very familiar in Turkey but were attuned to taste that uh, the Turkish people liked. And so uh, Turkey, again, I think is, is something in the future that we should go back and concentrate on. So let's move on to our 2020 projects now. Um, in 2020, USDA and the Market Access Program was handled through the American Pecan Council. And so the American Pecan Council had an allocation of just over 631,000. Uh, APC did a 50-50 split between USPGC and APC. So I'm going to talk about our split of the money and where we focus on. So for 2020, the market access funding, uh, APC allocations to the U.S. Pecan Growers was $316,000. Um, I just rounded the numbers up a little bit. Here's the timeline, just so you know, because uh, this is something people have asked me about. I think it's important for you to realize. In December 2019, USDA announced the MAC or the market access allocations. USPGC submitted several versions of our China marketing plan to APC International Committee. In May, USDA and the Foreign Ag Service required request for proposals or RFPs for all contractors retained on behalf of APC for the international projects. Previously, we had had those contracts and we thought they would be in place, but since um, the uh, APC was the new co cooperator up under USDA, uh, RFPs were required. So in June, July, potential contractors were, were set out, reviews were done by the uh, APC's International Committee and USPGC Executive Committee. In July, a China contractor was selected. August, we met with Weber's Shanwick Shanghai office virtually, of course, talking about the marketing campaigns. And in August, we had another meeting to discuss with APC and U.S. Pecans and Weber's Shanwick to, to the programs and what they wanted to do. And in September, programs will begin with social media ca campaigns. So let me give you a bird's eye view into the U.S. Pecans Agricultural Trade Program. This is the funding that was put out by the Trump administration uh, last year and uh, the ability for the different commodities to be able to find alternate markets in, inside of China due to the tariff problem. So our funding at 1.3, the balance of that, part of that was used in 2019, and we'll be using the rest of it in 2020, and we're focusing on China, Korea, and the Southeast Islands. In the beginning of 2020, everybody had high hopes. There was a trade deal signed between the U.S. and China. Uh, as we moved into February, the details of the trade deal came out, and what was found was that China importers could apply for this tariff exemption or waiver on the additional tariff, but it was not across the board tariff reduction. As we moved into March, the China Tariff Committee started to review the China importer's applications. Uh, if the uh, importer was uh, granted the waiver or exemption, the tariff on our product would end up coming down to a 22%. And just a footnote, before the China war, uh, trade war started, we had a tariff of 7% in China on pecans. As it began to spike through 17, 18, and 19, there was a result, it ended up with 57% tariff, which was uh, almost crippling to us. Although tariffs have decreased to 22%, if you are an improved, approved importer for the exemption, it still is higher than what we want it to be. If you did not get approved as an importer without the exemption, your rate remained at 52%. So you ask yourself, what else could happen to the industry at this point? We shouldn't have asked. COVID-19 hit. 
As a result of COVID, our plans for 2020 USPGC of ATP program plans had to be changed. They required revisions. In 2020, USPGC had scheduled several trade shows in China, um, Bakery China, CL, Hefe, China INC. Many of these shows had to be rescheduled into 2021. Uh, Bakery China and Hefe both moved into 2021. CL China, as of now, which is early September, the show is still going to be uh, attended. We will have our China contractor attend the booth uh, and take care of the customers there. We don't anticipate a huge crowd, but but, uh, we need to move on and try to make this uh, year as normal as possible. Uh, the China INC, which was usually held in early August, was going to be held in September this year. We participated by providing a video of information from uh, the U.S. So this is not a typical year, but um, we had to reschedule and change what we were doing and try to get as much as we could for promotions done in China for the year. Social media. So having said <clears throat> that we couldn't do a lot of the shows, we have to go back and address how do we handle getting our product in front of all the different consumers in China. One of the favorite things we found out is these KOLs, which are key opinion leaders, are followed quite dramatically. Woody is the founder of Chin Flavors, which has over 760 followers. He's also a very uh, famous food photographer, and he, he does a lot of interaction on his, his websites and his platforms. He produced about six or eight different videos for us. He targeted different things. We were looking at, you know, white collar workers, high school students, the elderly, even some fitness groups, and uh, he posted the first video on Weibo and WeChat. Early January, he had over 2 million reviews, 836 clicks, and over 400 shares. So it's a very good medium for us to use to be able to get more information out about our product. These are a couple of videos I'm going to share with you, um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk to you at the end as to what they're talking about. This is a very strange city, a 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 strange 回到家还会习惯给自己做一份晚餐，或许简单，却从不含糊。今晚我来用美国避风果做一份能量饭团，煮饭时加入一点油和盐会更好吃。清洗干净，虾肉去腥，水开后就可以把虾肉放进锅里了。米饭加入油、寿司醋、海苔碎和喜欢的美国避风果。丰富的蛋白质与氨基酸不光补充能量，也同样帮助缓解工作的疲劳。最后加入 Q 弹的虾肉，捏成饭团，放入盘中，咬一口饭团，继续工作。我始终相信，在不久的将来，这里会有为我闪烁的霓虹，也会有不一样的未来。技术来上海的这些年，和家人总是聚少离多。不知道是从什么时候起，我开始珍惜这些一起的时光。哪怕是握住妈妈的手，看着电视；哪怕是一颗颗剥好美国避根果，放在你的手里。两座城市，两种生活。我试着给到你我能力所及的最好，就像我成长中你所给我的一样。红糖碧根果花糕，我想做适合你口味的美食。小麦粉、红糖、酵母、水，因为加入了美国碧根果而变得营养丰富。它可以帮助改善血液循环，增强身体健康。一小时发酵，四十分蒸煮，蒸好晾凉，沏好装盘。一块发糕，一碗清粥，一小碟刚刚剥好的碧根果，或许这就是幸福该有的味道吧。
。小时候总是嘲笑着对我妹说：“以你的长相，就只适合好好学习了。”可一晃就真的到了这个时候。今年的特殊高考延期了一个月，看着你上网课，埋头做题，总会让我想起当年咱妈妈洗好的水果和避根果，悄悄放在桌子上。我现在也记好了，拿给你。看着你做的那些题，我头也大。除了精神上的鼓励和支持，真的不知道还能帮你做点什么。这个下午，我做了一份奶油蛋糕给你，还记得小时候我们吃的满脸都是的样子，想想就笑。我来把美国鼻根果切碎，放在面糊上，帮你补充维生素、矿物质和能量。现在用脑多。对你的记忆力也有帮助的。一百八十度，二十五分钟，放凉了，挤上一圈奶油，插上一颗美国鼻根果，然后悄悄地拿到你的桌子前。哎，你看你，还是跟小时候一样。在我心里，你永远都是那个长不大的妹妹。高考，加油！Previous videos were shot in China as part of our social media program and give、uh, exposure to the elderly, to the Chinese worker, and to students how to incorporate pecans into their diets. A couple of the ones we had. This is the WeChat post. We continue to do WeChat. We have different topics we talk about.、And、this is the American pecan farmers. We had high hopes for the trade deal. They have talked about the eat, healthy、uh, eating during the Spring Festival and Valentine's Days and the tariff exclusion. So there's constant information on WeChat about pecan. So now we move into Korea. Korea has been a bright spot. We've continued to do promotions to Korea, even through COVID. We've had some online, and our imports have continued to increase in Korea. So let me share that with you. Okay, this slide shows you the Korean imports from 2016 to 2020, and we've even added some projections for 21 and 22.、Uh, we started out in 2016. You can follow the scale yourself right there on uh, the uh, slide. We had a little bit of bump or hiccup in 2018,、uh, went down just a little bit, and then we started moving back up in the end of 18 and going through 19 and 20.、Uh, we project that 21 and 22 will be banner years as well with the projects that we've done in Korea. We have increased the consumption awareness, the health benefits, the taste of pecans, the versatility. So our promotions are working, and we continue to believe Korea will be a bright spot going forward. All right, this is our first quarter tree nut comparison. I think it's really interesting. It's from 2016 to 2020, and if you'll look on the left hand side, it shows you the nuts that we're being compared to. The slide is a little bit bunched up, but I think you can read it. You're showing almonds, walnuts, pecans, pistachios, Brazil nuts, cashews, and macadamia. The dark blue. Uh, line is pecans, and you'll look at the first half of 2016. Across the bottom line, you'll see 17, 18, 19, and first half of 2020. And in 2020, we actually our percentage of growth rate the first half was more than almonds or walnuts. There's actually decreased a little bit. So this lets us know that our message is going through.、Uh, people are starting to understand more about pecans, and they're good for you, and the health and the versatility. So we want to continue moving into. Okay, this slide gives you、uh, information on the activities that we've done the first half of、uh, the, the year and ongoing in Korea. We continue to do our in-store promotions with all the hypermarkets from E-Mart to Hyundai to Lotte to several others. That did take、uh, a pause during the COVID that was so bad through March, April, and May, but it's picked back up in June. Uh, Koreans actually love to go to the grocery stores. They have beautiful markets and have a lot of information in those markets on different recipes and different things they can buy. So it's quite an adventure to go to the store there. But、uh, hopefully, we'll be able to continue our in-store promotions in that country. Our Seoul Cafe Show is a very, very popular.、Uh, Conference that is held every year in November. This is the first time we've been able to actually、uh, be a participant in that show. Every year we had tried, it had been sold out. So we have a lot of high hopes for getting a lot of interest and、uh, trying to get some new contacts. All year long, we continue our social media, as to Instagram, Facebook, and our Korean website.、Um, we do media coverage. We had a couple in June, and we have a couple in September. 
uh, different magazine and articles. Uh, we also also did a, what they call a product placement, or PPL. We actually do a short video uh, that is tied to a healthy um, TV show. This year it was one called Switch, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a little bit. And we continue to do some online in September and October with uh, Wise Table, which is a huge recipe blog type um, website. And it's, it'll be going on for a while. And then we're going to end out the year again this year with the Consumer and Industry Survey to see where we were uh, from 2019 to 2020 and how our benchmarks were holding. So this is just a couple of pictures that told you about the in-store promotions and our partner retailers. We've done a lot. There's a lot of stores you can see. Emar has 170. Lotte has 150. Kim's Club has 100. Honda has 52. Home Plus has 99. And Emar not trade, it's just a regular e mark they have 105. And so these have been the bulk of our uh, in-store promotion partners. They've done very well, and we've created a, a constant contact with them and trying to support them and all of that. Okay, our TV advertising in Korea through our product placements was done around a health show called Switch in June the 1st. Um, there was four different recipes that were presented that day, and we had about 176,000 views. If you look at the very bottom, it'll tell you the media value was 74,000 plus. The PR value was 450,000, or just under that. We had nine media coverages, 34 online articles at portal sites, and 20 postings by food bloggers, and 32 broadcasts on TV. Very successful, and has actually encouraged the purchase of pecans over the last couple of years we've done these. Great medium. And in Korea, it's all about the packaging. If you look on this slide, um, the number of packagings uh, from the different retailers has increased dramatically from the first year or two we were going to Korea. Uh, each one I have on their private label down at the bottom. You'll see on 2019 the packages offline, which means you are in the store, and then they had 15 packages of online. That was a 50% growth. In 2020, there's 13 packages offline and 25 plus packages online, which is a 92% growth. So pecans are being uh, you know, purchased in Korea, and we see as a bright spot in all of our promotions. So Southeast Asia, we decided to do a couple of social media programs in some direct countries. Uh, Thailand was one of them. In Thailand, for our social media, we did Facebook posts or ads. These are just a couple of clips from several of the posts that we did through the month of July. These target uh, people who are concerned about their weight and how they can incorporate pecans into their diet. Uh, it's a good, healthy snack, but it's got protein. talks about them being shipped from the U.S. and the different you know, vitamins and things that are in pecans. So it's reaching out to those who are looking for a healthy uh, substitute for snacking um, and adding pecans to their diet. This is the way we measure the success of the post. This was done in Thailand on Facebook, and if you see the number of people that it reached, uh, it was measured by the KP. Eyes, which is the key performance indicators, uh, reached over 19,375. And there was uh, a couple of other things we did, some Im images, and we didn't do a video here. But uh, we felt like it was a good start for us to start in Thailand to bring some attention to become. We repeated our efforts in Thailand into Vietnam through social media and Facebook. So this is a, a snapshot of the digital marketing we uh, performed in Vietnam in uh, July. Here's a couple of snapshots of the ads that were put on Facebook. We actually show them with salads. We also show them used in desserts and the other items they can uh, use pecans in, the versatility. We talk about uh, the pecan industry on here and the commodities coming from the U.S. and where the prime locations are. So we give them a little bit of history and some information on pecans. It's kind of interesting to grab their attention. Again, this is measured through the KPI metric. I've got some Facebook ads, the post, how many were reached. And you'll see that here with the engagements and uh, how much we've done. And this was only for about a month, month and a half. So we think it really did have enough views that was worth our time. We'll probably continue in the future. So that's pretty much our review of 2019 and our current status in 2020. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm Janice at uspecons.org. I hope you have a wonderful harvest season.
Hi everyone, I'm Angela Sebastoria, the pecan entomologist at the University of Georgia. I'm also an extension specialist focusing on integrated pest management in pecans in the southeast. Welcome to the 2020 Georgia Pecan Growers Conference. This year is supposed to be UGA's turn to host the Georgia Pecan Field Day. Given the COVID pandemic situation, we unfortunately cannot move forward with the event. So I am taking this opportunity to give you an overview of what my research and extension programs since I started with UGA in 2018. To start with, I'm here at Ponder Farm in Tai Tai, Georgia. Uh, in my back is the entomology research block where we conduct different research trials including spray trials and insect pest monitoring. We both have mature trees and non-bearing trees planted in about 25 acres. I would want to thank the Georgia Pecan Growers because through the Pecan Commodity Commission, you have provided financial support to maintain this orchard for the last two years. I am also thankful for the grower support on other research efforts in my lab, including work on ambrosia beetles and pecan hedging. For the rest of my presentation, I will give you some highlights on our different research and extension activities, including ones in collaboration with growers and USDA scientists, as well as extension agents. Thank you. As you can see here, there are several pests that attack different parts of a pecan tree. There are leaf feeders, such as aphids and mites, nut feeders, including pecan nut case bearer, shuckworm, and pecan weevil. And lastly, there are root and trunk feeders, such as prionus root borers and ambrosia beetles. To add to the complexity, these pests occur at various points in the growing season. There are pests occurring in spring to early summer, and there are those that occur in the summer. It is therefore important to know if and when these pests are present and the type of management strategies that are economically feasible and ecologically sustainable for growers. So I'll talk about my projects in a chronological manner, starting with activities in early spring involving ambrosia beetles, then late spring on pecan nutcase bears, and finally during the summer, which include the activities listed here. Ambrosia beetles are wood boring tiny beetles that attack different tree species, including pecans. Evidence of ambrosia beetle infestation includes holes and sawdust toothpicks sticking out of the trunks. Their attacks are associated with young, stressed, and dying trees. In Georgia production system, ambrosia beetle infestations commonly involved recently planted pecan trees that suffered from transplant stress and trees planted in low-lying areas exposed to sustained water-saturated conditions. My research in ambrosia beetles includes survey and monitoring to track the season-long activity of this pest. This allows us to inform growers when to scout for injuries on their trees and manage for this pest if needed. For this research, ethanol baited bottle traps were deployed along the wooded border and in the field interior about 30 meters into the orchards. We use ethanol as bait because ambrosia beetles are attracted to ethanol. These traps were deployed in young orchards in Quitman, Nashville, and Irwinville. Shown here are trapping results in 2019. Flight activity starts in mid-February with bouts of increased activity in mid to late March and mid-April to early May across all sites. Therefore, recently planted trees in the spring can be vulnerable to ambrosia beetle attacks, so scouting for injury is best done during this period in the field. Another important finding from this study is that ambrosia beetles are present throughout the growing season in southern Georgia. This is important because vulnerable trees can be attacked way beyond spring and early summer. This implies that growers should maintain healthy trees season long to prevent ambrosia beetle attacks. It is important to note that ambrosia beetles were captured in traps located in the border as well as in the interior of the orchards, and captures between border and interior traps did not differ except at equipment site. This means that stressed trees in the middle of an orchard are still susceptible to attacks by ambrosia beetles. Therefore, scouting for injury should not only be limited to border trees. A good rule of thumb to follow for scouting is to scout trees in low-lying areas or trees that may have been subjected to stress-inducing factors which may include but not limited to flooding, diseases, frost injury, and mechanical injury. 
Another important project that my lab was able to pursue in collaboration with Andrew Sawyer and Tucker Price was investigating the efficacy of different grower-based management strategies against ambrosia beetles. We compared painting with white latex paint, use of trunk protectors, tree painting plus one pyrethroid spray at the time of painting, and lastly, pyrethroid sprays every seven days. The study was done in the spring early this year. Results presented here are from the trial site at Linux, Georgia, indicating that a single pyrethroid spray mixed with paint and spraying pyrethroid material every seven days were the most effective from preventing ambrosia beetle attacks. White latex paint, on the other hand, was not effective. These experiments also showed that vulnerable trees covered in tree protectors can be attacked by ambrosia beetles, and the attacks were found on the covered surfaces. It is therefore important for growers to remove these tree protectors to scout for injuries. It is important to note that our results here is based on low ambrosia beetle populations. Results may vary in high population conditions. In the future, we would like to test the effectiveness of different spraying frequency and varying rates of spray materials. We're also interested to test other insecticidal materials, both chemical and biological, against this pest. In late April, early May, pecan nut case bear moths become active. They mate, lay their eggs on pecan nutlets, and their caterpillars bore into the nuts and consume the nuts from the inside. Their attacks can cause nutlets to drop. In the southeast, pecan nut case bear problems are not as serious compared to the western pecan growing areas of Texas and Oklahoma. In fact, in heavy crop load years here in Georgia, nut case bearers can provide natural fruit thinning services. However, due to unusually high reported PNC attacks in 2019 in Georgia, we joined the efforts in monitoring the nut case bear moth emergence activity this year using the PNC risk map previously developed by Dr. Marvin Harris as part of the Pecan IPM Pipe Program. The monitoring in Georgia was done in collaboration with several extension agents, growers, scouts, and industry collaborators. Pheromone beta traps, as pictured here, were deployed in different counties and traps were checked daily. Once two days of consecutive captures were observed, the initial date was reported online via the Ag Pest Monitor website facilitated by Bugwood, and a decision management guide based on temperature data was generated. This is available to growers and the public. This provides growers information for the best time to spray insecticides that target the immature or caterpillar stage of PNC. We plan to continue this monitoring effort in the coming years, adding more monitoring sites and deploying more traps per site to better magnify moth activity. Pecan hedge pruning, an orchard management strategy to control size and optimize sunlight, has gained momentum in the southeastern U.S. in the last few years, primarily due to the numerous horticultural benefits as listed here. It has also been shown to effectively manage pecan scab infection by ensuring better spray coverage of the canopies. As shown in these pictures, the removal of the limbs greatly changes the structure of the trees, which provides habitats to various insects, both pests and natural enemies. Opening up the canopies may also promote better coverage of insecticidal materials. Thus, it is also important to examine if pecan hedge pruning has an impact in pests and beneficial insect populations and assess if the impacts are negative or positive for growers. In 2018 and 2019, we sampled and monitored insect populations and insect activity and associated injuries caused by various pecan pests, including aphids, mites, and nut case bearers on hedge and non-hedge orchard blocks in Marshallville, Georgia. We also monitored the beneficial insect populations, including aphid parasitoids, predatory mites, and other general predators in the same blocks for both years. In the interest of time, here's the summary of the results. In 2018, hedging showed no effects on the populations of pests and natural enemies, but it did show positive implications by way of reduced black aphid injury and early season increased parasitism rates. In 2019, 
aphid populations were higher on hedge trees during mid-season. Mites were higher in the lower canopy of hedge trees in August and higher in the upper canopy of non-hedge trees in July. Black aphid injury was the same for both treatments. Aphid parasitism was higher on non-hedge trees later in the season, and natural enemy populations did not vary between hedge and non-hedge trees. It is also important to note that the winter pruning program in the research blocks was as follows. Year one, west side of the trees was pruned. Year two, east side of the trees was pruned. Year three, no pruning was done. Hence, we conducted our insect sampling and monitoring in years one and three of the program. Given the differences in the results in both years, we could preliminarily conclude that the effects of hedging on arthropod populations, both pests and natural enemies, may differ depending on the cycle or timing of the hedging program. In addition, in both years, injury on nutlets by PNC and insect-related injury at harvest did not differ between hedge and non-hedge trees. Generally speaking, our results imply that hedging does not make insect problems worse in a conventionally managed orchard. In collaboration with fellow UGA and USDA scientists, we are looking at how tree age and timing of pecan hedge pruning, either done in the summer or winter, can impact various aspects of pecan production, including yield, quality, water uptake efficiency, diseases, and below ground entomopathogen populations. We have teamed up with an economist to help us assess the financial feasibility of this management strategy in the southeastern US. Perhaps one of the most important activities we do is conducting spray trials, as this allows us to test the efficacy of new materials in comparison with insecticides currently available in the market. It also is a practical way of tracking development of insecticide resistance. In the last two and a half years, we have tested both labeled and unlabeled products against various pecan pests as listed here. Results from these trials are shared with growers and extension agents via extension meetings, spray guides, the My IPM app, and in-person consultations. I included two insecticide-related updates here that some of you may not be aware of. First, Closer is now available as Transform WG, and the European Union maximum residue limit for chlorpyrifos or Lorspan is 0 0.05 parts per million. As U.S. pecans are sold to European countries, it would be good to take note of this information. It provides another reason to lessen the use of this broad-spectrum insecticide. Below are the results based on a trial conducted in 2019, comparing several ephesida materials, carbine, closer, and safina, and their impacts on aphids and the populations of parasitic wasps. The highlights of the results include all the materials tested decreased aphid numbers seven days after spraying, and aphid numbers remained low on trees sprayed with closer and safina with a higher concentration 14 days after spraying. It is important to note that all the materials showed no negative effects on the parasitic wasp population. This implies that growers have access to materials with multiple modes of action that are potentially not harmful to parasitoids. My PhD student, Kaya Slusher, is replicating this study this year to confirm results. The same student is also involved in various studies pertaining to pecan aphid parasitism, including looking at changes in the aphid and parasitic wasp populations across three commercial orchards in Georgia. He is also looking at the distribution of parasitic wasp at different heights of the tree. He is also analyzing the cut content of predators, such as lady beetles, collected in pecan orchards to examine the composition of their diet. The findings from his studies will further elucidate the importance of maintaining thriving populations of beneficial insects in pecan orchards. Later in the growing season, from late July to August, pecan weevils emerge from the ground. They mate, they feed on the nuts, and female weevils use the mature nuts for egg laying, and the weevil larvae will bore into the nuts and feed internally. Based on previous studies, about 90% of the weevils use the trunk of pecan trees to climb up the canopies, while only 10% fly directly into the canopy. 
Taking advantage of this behavior, we explore the use of insecticidal netting impregnated with deltametrin, a pyrethroid, installed on trunks of mature pecan trees. This study is done in collaboration with Dr. Ted Cottrell at the USDA. Under laboratory conditions, we tested the efficacy of insecticidal nets on pecan weevil mortality and found that pecan weevils were mostly killed within 10 seconds of exposure to the insecticidal nets. In the field, significantly more pecan weevils were killed in trees wrapped with insecticidal nettings than those that were not. Follow-up studies in 2019 also indicated that nettings left for a year in the field were equally as lethal to the weevils than netting and exposed to the field, indicating lasting effects of the nets. It is, however, important to note that currently these nettings are not labeled for agricultural or commercial use. Given the nature of using such nets, once permitted, it may be more practical for small-scale growers or homeowners with pecan trees in their yard. Here are other IPM-based studies that my lab has been involved in. It includes releasing predatory mites using drones for biocontrol of leaf scorch mites, monitoring of the root boring beetles to better understand their ecology and inform management decisions. Lastly, we have been surveying populations of the invasive brown mummerted stink bug in South Georgia. Currently, no established populations of these stink bug species have been reported south of Macon County. It is important to be proactive in monitoring for this invasive pest that can be potentially damaging to many agricultural crops grown in South Georgia, including pecans. If you want to know more about these projects, please do not hesitate to contact me. Apart from the various research activities I have been doing, here are some web-based extension efforts that I have been able to initiate. First is the My IPM app, which can be freely installed in Android and Apple phones. It provides a handy resource for pecan growers and extension agents on insect pest identification and biology and their management options. The pecan pest monitoring websites for pecan nutcase bearer and ambrosia beetles are also accessible online. Lastly, I have been able to also provide timely insect-related updates via the UGA pecan blog. Another extension material that I was able to develop together with the UGA pecan team is this pecan management calendar that shows various aspects of pecan production and our respective recommendations. It is also printed in waterproof poster paper. Copies are available at the GPGA office. Printing of this poster was funded by the Pecan Grower Commission. I would like to thank my students, my colleagues at UGA and USDA, grower collaborators, extension agents, and funding institutions for continuously supporting my programs. I am very fortunate to be given the opportunity to serve the pecan grower community through the University of Georgia. Thank you also to the Georgia Pecan Growers Association for the opportunity to share my work. If you have any questions or require clarification in any of the topics I presented, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Since 1966, Modern Electronics has been serving the pecan industry with high quality machines and unparalleled customer service. We offer a full line of processing equipment from in-shell sizers to inspection tables. Our product line includes every machine needed to process pecans on virtually any scale. Others claim to be the best, we have the pedigree to prove it. Give us a call today. I would like to thank the Georgia Pecan Growers Association for the opportunity to present this information to you too. Most insect damage to pecan is done by a handful of pests. Three species of aphids, the pecan weevil, stink bugs, hickory shuckworm, and pecan nut case bear. As such, most research on insect pests of pecan focuses on these 
as does most effort toward insect control on the planet. A group of lesser known insects, the scale insects, deserve more attention because of their ability to cause economic injury before being detected. The scale insects are comprised of many species, with most being minute and highly specialized. As found on pecan, they do not look like insects, and many species blend in with natural plant coloration. Although there are more than 20 species that feed on pecan, most of them are only found occasionally on pecan. Three of the more common scale species found on pecan are the obscure scale, the white peach scale, and the giant pecan scale. Populations of the obscure scale, top left, can reach densities great enough to kill pecan limbs. More often than not, this is the most damaging species of scale attacking pecan. The white peach scale, top right, readily attacks pecan. Males of this scale insect produce a bright white covering that is easily seen when populations increase. The giant pecan scale, on the bottom, is a common species that is rarely noticed. It is usually found under bark on pecan trunks. During the late summer and early fall, the pink or red mobile females come out from underneath the pecan bark to mate with winged males. If conditions allow the species to increase, it can be damaging to pecan. Today I will focus on the obscure scale, the most damaging scale attacking pecan. The obscure scale is a species of armored scale. Armored scales live under a protective covering made from wax they secrete. Although armored scales produce the protective covering, it is not attached to the insect. In fact, the scale, that is the protective covering, can be flipped over to reveal the insect underneath it. For most of the scale insect's life, it is immobile. The scale is only mobile after hatching. This is a crawler stage which allows it to disperse to a nearby feeding site on the same limb. Once settled at its feeding site, it molts and loses its legs and is thus immobile. The scale will feed and secrete the protective scale covering. Adult females are made immobile, but upon maturity, males have wings and seek females for mating. These small insects may not seem like they could become problematic, but they most certainly can. Unfortunately, most scale issues are only noticed because of their negative impacts on the plant. Here, I want to show just how dense scale populations can become and why they are easy to overlook. The image shown here is of San Jose scale on peach. At first glance, you may think that this is just an image of peach bark and the color of the bark is normal. However, let's zoom in on this image to have a better look. Magnification of the image begins to show that most of what we see is not bark, but the scale insects. The density of the scale explains much of the bark color. Let's increase magnification again. At this magnification, the individual scale insects are becoming clearer. Let's zoom in. Zoomed into this level, we clearly see most of the scale insects as dark circles with a dot in the middle. Most of the scales shown here are small because they have just formed the protective cover. The light orange spots the out-of-focus light orange spots on the left and the single orange spot in focus on the right are the crawlers of this species. Considering that each of these insects is feeding on the plant, it becomes clearer how this small insect can become a limb-killing pest. For the remainder of this presentation, I will focus on the obscure scale. The obscure scale commonly attacks chestnuts, oaks, hickories, and pecans. Given the abundance of these host plants across pecan growing areas, the reservoirs serving as sources of infestation near pecan orchards are numerous. The obscure scale is a well-known pest of pecan. Its ability to produce limb-killing populations and its impact on seedling and improved varieties has been noted since the 1920s and 30s. Obscure scale at the density seen in the top image should be controlled. A scale infestation of a pecan tree usually starts in the lower interior part of the tree. Over time, as the population increases, the crawlers continue to move up the tree and out limb terminals. The image at the top of the screen is from the tree and the image at the bottom of the screen. The sparse canopy appeared to be a direct result of the obscure scale density on the tree. The tree on the left did not have an obscure scale issue. Notice the full canopy on that tree. Obscure scale has one generation per year. Immature scale are present from the summer through winter, with scale reaching the adult stage during the next spring and summer. Mated females lay eggs during the late spring to early summer. Because the female is immobile, she lays her eggs underneath her own scale cover. 
When the eggs hatch, the crawlers disperse to nearby sites on the limb to settle and feed. Although many crawlers disperse away from their mother, some stay and feed under the cover produced by the mother. Even though they are underneath the protective scale cover produced by their mother, they still secrete wax to produce their own protective cover. This is how layers of scale build up on limbs. Monitoring is done by sampling for scale on bark. A hand lens is useful in this process. On older trees, search the smoother bark on scaffold limbs and terminals. Live obscure scale will not be found on the old bark of trunks. On younger trees, search bark on both trunks and limbs. When you find an area of bark with scale, use a knife blade to scrape away the scale coverings to easily see the white wax left behind when the scale covering is removed. This method allows you to quickly assess the relative density of scale. Over time, you will develop a search image based upon the texture and color of bark where scale is found, making infestations easier to find. Once you have found obscure scale, determining whether it is alive or dead is important. That's because the protective scale covering remains on the tree for a long time, so knowing if the insect underneath is alive or dead is important for management decisions. When the scale cover is flipped off, a living or dead scale should be visible. A live scale is a fluid-filled sac that will burst when pressure is applied. Dead scale are dried out and fall apart when pressure is applied. It is common to find limbs with an apparent high scale density, but most are dead. The crawlers are the most susceptible stage of obscure scale, and therefore the easiest to control, because they are not protected underneath a cover. Crawler emergence can be detected by applying black electrical tape, sticky side out, around infested pecan limbs. Crawlers will become stuck on the tape and can be seen using a hand lens. A degree day model developed for obscure scale predicted that crawler emergence at Byron, Georgia would begin on May 26, 2020. Even if the model is not 100% accurate, it is useful for adding a window to begin sampling for crawlers. Recently, warmer win winters make this model even more useful determining crawler emergence. Almost a two-week earlier emergence of crawlers was predicted between 2020 and 2014. When an insect can become as abundant as obscure scale, natural enemies will exploit that resource. In fact, there are predators of this scale, specifically certain species of lady beetles and predaceous mites that feed on crawlers. In addition, there are several species of parasitic wasps that attack this scale. The hole in the scale cover in the top image is where a parasitic wasp emerged through the scale cover after eating the scale insect. But one of the more interesting biological control agents of this scale is a pink scale fungus. When scouting for this scale, the fungus is commonly observed growing out from underneath the scale covering, having already killed and consumed the scale insect. The parasitic wasp and the fungus are why patches of dense scale can be comprised of mostly dead scale. Historically, dormant oils have been the choice for controlling scale insects on orchard crops. Application of dormant oil at 2% to pecan using high volumes to ensure thorough coverage is needed. A typical air blast application using up to 100 gallons per acre will not provide the coverage needed. Application volume of the oil solution must be high enough to suffocate the scale. A repeat application 10 to 14 days later is recommended. Where layers of scale exist, dormant oils may not provide an expected level of control. Hickories are noted to be sensitive to dormant oil applications under certain conditions. Mixing dormant oil with some sulfur or sulfur-containing products can form phytotoxic compounds. Please read the label for any dormant oil product you will apply to the time. Insecticides provide another management option. However, targeting the vulnerable crawler stage will provide the best results because the crawler has not formed a protective cover. Using the predictive model to estimate crawler emergence and confirming crawler emergence using the electrical tape will indicate when a treatment should be applied. Many contact insecticides will do a good job controlling the crawler stage, but please read the label for specific guidance for usage on pecan. Spirotectomat has systemic activity against San Jose scale on orchard crops if applied early in the spring before foliage has fully expanded. A penetrative spreading surfactant should be used with spirotetramat. The insect growth regulator pyroproxifen has good activity against scale, making this another good in-season choice. It is also most effective if targeting the crawler stage. 
The take-home message I wish to leave you with is to be aware of scale insects on pecan, especially obscure scale. Unfortunately, you may notice its effect on the tree before you notice the scale. Learn to recognize scale on pecan and the density of living scale that should be controlled. Be aware of the control options for different times of the year and how to achieve the best control possible with each option. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Sarah Cook and I'm the Director of Domestic Trade at the Georgia Department of Agriculture. Along with our Interim Division Director Paul Thompson and our colleague Chris Rash, we make up the Business Development Team at your Department of Ag. This past week, Governor Brian Kemp announced that Georgia has been chosen as the best state in which to do business for the seventh year in a row. It is no coincidence that Georgia is nature's favorite state as well as business's favorite state. We have wonderful working relationships with our sister agencies, such as the Georgia Department of Economic Development, Georgia's research institutions of higher learning, and regional connections to our local economic developers. It is our job to bring agribusiness to the forefront of people's minds and to remind them that agribusiness is economic development. In fact, agriculture is Georgia's number one industry, and our entire team exists to keep it that way and to help it grow. It is our mission to help you as a producer maximize the earnings potential from the crop that you grow, whether it's assisting you to start an on-farm store, promoting your raw ag commodities, creating value-added products, or sending product out across our state, our nation, and the entire globe. Our team sits on go, waiting to assist you in any way we can. In a normal year, our domestic marketing team represents Georgia's companies at 13 national trade shows, including Produce Marketing Association's Fresh Summit, the Summer Fancy Food Show in New York City, and Natural Products Expos East and West. These national trade shows can expose your company and brand to tens of thousands of potential buyers from national grocery stores, big box retailers, small boutique grocers and food purveyors, and regional chains. Promoting high quality products like Georgia pecans at these events is a great opportunity if you're considering a branded snack or ingredient item. Paul Thompson participates in countless global trade missions across the globe to promote Georgia products. Pecans are making their way to new countries where relationships are being fostered. Chefs are introduced to a multitude of ways they can utilize pecans in new and exciting ways and also complementing the traditional cuisine of their areas. You're hearing about SESTA today and the myriad of opportunities you can take advantage of through their programming. Chris Rosh and I are boots on the ground to support and manage our Georgia producers involvement in the program. You have a direct line to two SESTA activity managers right in your home state and even in your area. I'm a hometown girl working and living in Ashburn, Georgia, so I'm a quick hop, hop skip and a jump from your farm. Our cell phone numbers and emails are provided to you. Please take advantage of our offer to help you in any way. Thank you for letting us help you grow your company and helping us remind everyone how amazing Georgia is and that we are indeed nature's favorite state. Have a great rest of your conference. Since 1998, Avery Crop Insurance Risk Management Specialists have provided personalized service for pecan growers, ensuring over 50% of the pecan acreage in Georgia and over 30% nationwide Avery is your preferred risk management team.
Hi, my name is Danielle Coco. I'm the marketing director at the Southern U.S. Trade Association. Thank you to the Georgia Pecan Growers Association for inviting us to give this presentation to you all today. I'm coming to you from my home office in New Orleans, uh, which is where SUSTA is headquartered. Um, but we cover the full Southern region. Um, we are a regional trade association that is federally funded primarily by the USDA, um, but our members are the departments of agriculture throughout the South. So agriculture commissioner Gary Black is one of our board members, as are the secretaries and commissioners of um, all of the Southern departments of agriculture. All right, so let's first talk a little bit about eligibility before I jump into the programs. Um, for companies to partake in um, SUSTA's programming, you have to be headquartered in our region. Um, as I mentioned, we are funded through the USDA, so companies that are not in the South can access very similar programs through um, different, different associations that are uh, just like SUSTA. Um, companies have to be small to medium sized by small business administration size standards. Um, so you can be up to three times the SBA size limit. And um, we want to make sure that companies have adequate resources and product supply before uh, really exploring exporting with us. Um, so hand in hand with that, we want to see an annual sales um, minimum of about $50,000. And then the company types we work with, you know, we work with growers and farmers, but we also work with manufacturers um, who are maybe um, doing more of a value added product, as well as export management companies who don't own the brands, but they manage the export. And then the products themselves have to have a brand name on them. Um, SUSTA helps companies promote brands, not just commodities. Um, and they have to be made from at least 50% US agriculture. So I don't think that's gonna be a problem with Georgia pecans um, being 100% US grown. And then the USDA likes to see an origin statement on products that are being promoted through the program. So it could be the Georgia grown logo or a made in the USA logo. Um, or just something simply stating that it's a product of America or USA. Um, and the product types we work with, um, it's quite a broad list. You'll see everything from grocery staples, um, including um, alcoholic beverages, seafood, pet foods, um, supplements and all natural beauty products, really anything that can meet that 50% US agriculture content. All right, so now we'll jump into the fun part, our programs and how we help companies increase their exports. Um, our global events program consists of three different event types. Um, we offer inbound trade missions, outbound missions, as well as international trade shows, or I should say pavilions at international trade shows. Um, so our inbound missions, um, this is where we bring foreign buyers here to the U.S. to meet with our companies. Uh, this typically takes place in something like a hotel ballroom, um, and you, the U.S. company, would set up your products and marketing materials on um, a table and the foreign buyers rotate. Um, these are great for companies that are new to exporting because, you know, you don't have to leave the U.S. Most of these are only $25 and you're getting um, great exposure to uh, pre-vetted foreign buyers. Uh, but we also have a lot of seasoned exporters who take part in these inbound missions. It's just an all-around great way to connect, um, again, with foreign buyers and distributors. Our outbound missions are similar in that you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with um, qualified buyers, but the big difference, of course, is that you are going to be traveling to the foreign country. Um, so it's, you know, a delegation of U.S. companies going overseas to meet with pre-qualified foreign buyers. Um, in addition to that, we're taking our companies on retail tours um, so that you can see uh, the competition. You can see the groceries in the supermarkets where your product might be and what similar products might be on the shelves, what their prices, etc. Um, and in addition to that, we 
also have our foreign consultants giving presentations on the market, um, you know, up-to-date information on labeling and different requirements. Um, so it's a much more robust way to explore a foreign market, um, but SUSTA does endeavor to make these as um, financially feasible for our small businesses. Usually they're anywhere from $400 to $600, and included in that fee is either one round trip international airfare or one person's lodging for the duration of the trade mission. Of course, um, in 2020, we have had to pivot like everyone and we're offering virtual trade missions. Um, so what these entail is one-on-one -on -one meetings with the foreign buyers, except it's not face-to-face, -face, it's over Zoom. So it's <laughs> kind of face-to-face, -face, but not, not exactly the same. Uh, we have really tried to go the extra mile to make it as close to the real deal as possible. Um, so we're offering companies a reimbursement up to a certain dollar amount to ship their products to the foreign market to one of our consultants there who would then distribute it to the foreign buyers that you're going to be meeting with um, so that they have your product samples in hand when you're talking with them. Um, and again, these are $25. So, you know, a really uh, inexpensive way to meet foreign buyers without even leaving your home or your office. And then, as I mentioned, we do offer pavilions at international trade shows all over the world. Uh, usually it's about 20 throughout the year where we have SUSTA pavilions. Um, and what SUSTA does is we'll rent out anywhere from five to 20 booth spaces and then turn around and offer those to our companies. Um, so, you know, you'd have your own full booth space where you can showcase your products and your marketing materials. Um, but the beauty of coming with SUSTA is that someone is holding your hand from the minute you sign up for that trade show through the actual event. Um, if you've ever exhibited, even in a, a local or a domestic show, you know there's a lot of paperwork um, involved. Well, imagine uh, how that is multiplied when you're trying to get your products into a foreign country. Um, so, you know, we're really there to make the process as easy as possible. Um, and we also, for most of the shows, we significantly reduce the cost. You know, some of these shows might be $5,000, $6,000, $8,000. Dollars. And if you come with us, it might be as low as $1,200 um, to participate. So um, these are a great option, again, to meet a, a really wide variety of buyers and hopefully make some solid connections. Um, in addition, SUSTA always has um, add-ons to, to these events. So if it's a market where English is not the primary business language, we'll have translators in your, or a translator in your booth for the whole show. Um, if it's a show like this one that we have here, which is a produce trade show, uh, we'll even have chefs on hand who are uh, uh, preparing samples um, of, you know, this is sweet potatoes, as you can see, you, know, you can't exactly sample that without cooking it. Um, so we're really trying to make it um, as, as easy as possible for our U.S. companies to go to these shows and exhibit. Um, and then I'll mention, too, that you can use our second program, Cost Share, to offset some of these expenses as well. Um, you can apply for 50% reimbursement of your booth fees, um, travel for two people, which I'll talk about later on in the presentation. And of course, we also offer webinars. Um, these are free and they're educational. Um, it might be on a specific market. So, you know, if you're really interested in Japan, we have one coming up September 16th. Um, it could be on logistics or trade financing. Um, and we have quite a library. If you have a MySusta account, you can go to past webinars and see all the webinars that we've done in the past um, and see if anything looks interesting there. All right, so as I mentioned, our second program is Cost Share. Um, this is where companies can apply to get 50% reimbursement of certain international marketing expenses. All right, so this is the full list of expenses that we can provide 50% reimbursement for. Um, the ones that I have bold at the top are the ones that in 2020 we're really seeing a lot of. Um, but in a typical year um, where we actually see a lot of companies come in is for um, the 50% reimbursement of uh, exhibiting at international trade shows and then the related travel. Um, but of course, we're not seeing that this year. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about how companies use the cost share program to promote their brands, um, you know, in a COVID or non-COVID year, but uh, through, through 
these kinds of promotions. So think about advertising. Um, it could be traditional advertising like TV, radio, grocery circulars, um, but it could also be billboards. It could be wrapping a van. It can also be social media campaigns or, um, you know, things like Google advertisements, um, as long as you're targeting a foreign market and that's indicated in the paperwork. So, you know, let's say it's, um, you are trying to take a, do a whole campaign on Facebook targeting the German market. You know, you can, these days, um, you can really geolocate your audience segment um, and uh, make it just uh, going towards folks on Facebook in Germany. So these are the kinds of things that you could get 50% reimbursement for. Um, there's also, um, you know, in-store displays, like you see top right, where you're calling attention to your products in the store. Um, in a non-COVID time, I should also mention, um, because I think this would be good for pecan companies, and I think we've done some of this in the past, um, I should mention the in-store, um, sampling and store demonstrations and food service promotions. Um, so you could, uh, you know, for a month, uh, hire somebody to go and do sampling in one of the groceries in a foreign country and apply to get 50% reimbursement of whatever the grocery is charging. Um, and, you know, you're gonna have to hire somebody to do the actual sampling. So you could apply to get 50% reimbursement of their wages, things like that. Um, so this program is really a way for you to get creative with your international marketing dollars and then apply to, to SESTA to get 50% um, of that back. All right, so how you get started is you would sign up on our website, SESTA.org, and you let us know which of our programs you're interested in participating global events and or 50% cost share, um, then we'll review your account. And as long as you meet basic eligibility, we'll, uh, we'll mark you eligible. For the 50% cost share program, there is another step. Um, companies have to apply each year for the cost share funds. Um, and what that entails is you let us know, you know, in the calendar year, what, what promotions you're gonna be doing in what countries and how much you're gonna be spending. And then when you submit your application, there's a $250 application fee, and you will pay a 6% fee in the contracting process. Um, and that 6% fee is on the amount that you're requesting in reimbursement. So if you tell us, you know, hey, I'm going to spend $20,000 on promotions in um, Taiwan, and I'm going to request 10,000 of that back from SESTA, you would pay a $600 $600 fee on that um, upfront. Then you go out and you go and you do the promotions and you make sure to collect the invoices and the receipts and all of the things that we're going to need from you. And then you submit those to SESTA. And it's usually about a month um, before you'll get your reimbursement, your 50% reimbursement. And I should mention before we uh, before we stop the presentation that um, SESTA and the Georgia Pecan Association have done some, um, some other events that are really specific for Georgia pecans in the Taiwan market, um, but I'm going to let Samantha talk more about that. So in closing, here is my contact information. If you have any questions about our programs or how to get involved, please give me a call or shoot me an email. Um, we'd love to get you on board. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.
Good morning, y'all. I want to thank Samantha and the board for having us here today and for allowing us to help grow new opportunities for the delicious premium Georgia pecan that you all work so hard to produce. I'm going to be brief so that we have plenty of time for questions at the end. I'm Mariana Chapman. My husband Andy and I own and operate a company called Eat Y'all. We help connect food farms with chefs who are looking for better ingredients. We've been helping chefs and farmers create valuable win-win partnerships since 2012, and those years have proven that both restaurants and farmers face similar ups and downs, including weather, politics, economic shifts, and labor shortages. But I think I speak for all of us when I say that this year has been a real doozy. The implications of restaurant closures, travel limitations, supply chain interruptions, and so much more due to COVID-19 have exposed opportunities that from our vantage point have been hiding just beneath the surface for at least a couple of years. I can't speak for everyone in the farm to table supply chain, but here at Eat Y'all, COVID really forced our hand. Since 2012, Eat Y'all has been on a mission to bring a larger share of the food dollar back to the farm gate. We've operated on the idea that transparency and connection between the farmer and end consumer were critical to the success of our mission. So we facilitated intentional connection and sales referrals on behalf of our producer partners through programs like our Eat Y'all Chef Camps, Eat Y'all Producer and Chef Sales Workshops, the Sweetest Chefs Pastry Chef Showcase event, Eat Y'all Connect Dinner Series, the Eat Y'all Podcast, and more. And every year, we've helped our partners achieve more and more success in both domestic and international food service outreach efforts. And then, 2020 happened. Quarantine stopped our events in their tracks. Restaurants tried to pivot, and then they closed. Supply chains broke, and our phones wouldn't quit buzzing with what quickly became America's question. Where can I buy safe, healthy food that will deliver to my door? Overnight, we were back in the direct-to-consumer business. By the first week in April, we had launched FindFamilyFarms.com, with an up-to-date directory of hundreds of American farms who offered local pickup and delivery or nationwide shipping and had inventory in stock and available for sale. Thanks to Georgia Grown and your own organization, many of your operations were on our initial directory. Within 30 days of launch, our email list had grown to over 24,000 subscribers who all wanted one thing weekly farm product updates. Colleagues of yours like Sunny Lane Farms, Front Porch Pecans, Gamus Pecans, and the Cohen family have been closely involved in our efforts over the past years and in the past months too. But then reality set in. Homeschooling, working from home, and managing the most lived-in house many of us have ever experienced um, did not bode well for grocery shopping across dozens of separate farm websites. At my house, grocery shopping all but became a full-time job, and I consider myself to have a few connections in that department. In May, restaurants did start opening slowly, only to discover that their sources for ingredients weren't back, or would never be back. Basic groceries we've all taken for granted weren't available in volume for many restaurants. Chefs still tell us they're having to rethink everything. Y'all, the second quarter of this year was nothing short of triage. For many in our sphere, it was simply about survival. Some of you had the blessing of surviving fourth quarter sales volume in the midst of social distancing. And some of you are climbing much more daunting mountains. We stand with you in that. Today, however, I am here to challenge and encourage you. The time has come to face our new reality, our new normal, 
It certainly does not look like what we expected at the start of this year, but that does not mean that this decade has anything short of unprecedented opportunity in store for your business. To meet the opportunities presented by demand for high quality, safe groceries touched by fewer human hands and delivered to their door, last week, we launched an online marketplace at findfamilyfarms.com where consumers can one-stop shop directly with American Family Farms and artisan food makers to get better groceries delivered. To meet the opportunities presented by the shakeup in ingredient availability and broken supply chains to restaurants, we've also launched Eat Y'all Direct, a procurement service that gives chefs quick and easy access to the full range of ingredients offered by America's Farms, shipped straight from the farm to the restaurant, it's true farm to table. With both of these projects, Eat Y'all is serving as a third party sales and marketing venue, offering direct to consumer sales on fine family farms and food service and wholesale at Eat Y'all Direct. We spent two months negotiating high volume shipping discount with UPS to make direct shipping more cost effective for everybody involved. And we are saving customers and producers time while maintaining something that's very important to us. 100% customer price and quality transparency for our producers and bringing more dollars back to the farm gate. Our mission is steadfast. Georgia pecans are a premium product. They are obviously superior to their competition in nearly every way. Overwhelmingly preferred by the chefs who have tried them with us. We've sampled these pecans to chefs across America and the world. It's time more people know about Georgia pecans and how to get them. I would encourage you to sweep away any pre-existing assumptions that you've held about the marketplace and be open to new opportunities and new ways of doing business because as the executive chef at a major MGM resort told us in mid-August, the supply chain broke and it keeps getting worse every week. We're rethinking everything. It was truly a privilege to work with the Georgia Pecan Growers Association in a small way during our India outbound mission last September. On that mission, we introduced dozens of the top chefs in New Delhi to the delicacy that is the Georgia Pecan. And we're really looking forward to moving that opportunity forward in 2021 as we lead an inbound mission in partnership with your organization, Georgia Grown and the Southern U.S. Trade Association. But there's much work yet to be done, especially on the domestic front. Such great opportunity brings great responsibility. Domestic opportunity is hot, both in direct-to-consumer sales and in restaurant sales, especially heading into the holiday season. It looks like you've got a bumper crop in store, and congratulations. I'd recommend the Shellers prepare to work overtime. Domestic chefs in our network and beyond are all looking for new sources of fresh, healthy ingredients, and they're eager to buy products like the premium Georgia pecan in volume for their pastry kitchens, ice cream shops, gluten-free offerings, and more. It is imperative that we recognize the opportunity in front of us and go seize it before it slips away. For the first time in my career, habits are truly changing. Awareness is heightened. Consumers and chefs alike have never been more aware of the fragility of their food supply. The time is now to capture the opportunity that we've dreamed about in agriculture for decades. Here at Eat Y'all, we've nurtured relationships with what today is a network of over 600 chefs who were already committed to thoughtful sourcing before this crisis, and now they are eager for the solutions that we can offer together. If we truly want a larger share of the food dollar to come back to the farm gate where it is most deserved, there has never been a better time than now to make that dream a reality. Our slogan here at Eat Y'all is grow better together. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. We are humbled and grateful for the responsibility of advocating for the Georgia pecan growers and we look forward to helping each of you do just that. Grow better together. My name is Jesse Bentley. 
Eight years ago, my father and I set out to expand on his 40 years of pecan knowledge and my desire to learn more. So we created Georgia Pecan Nursery. Our mission was simple, produce the highest quality nursery trees, provide excellent customer service, and produce enough availability to support our growing industry. Thanks to you, the grower, we've achieved all of our goals. It's 2020, and the ag markets are crazy once again this year. So add to the craziness, we're currently offering a 40% discount on all of our inventory. That's right, 40% discount on all of our inventory. Whether you're a seasoned grower or just jumping into the industry, we would love to assist you with all of your needs. Give us a call today while the inventory lasts. From our farm to yours, thank you and God bless. Good afternoon. I'm Richard Morgan, GM at Equus International Consulting, and today we'll be giving an overview of the Georgia Pecan Growers Association e-commerce platform in China. First, a couple of things that we'd like to go over besides a bit of background. Number one, what's the reality of the situation in China for U.S. agriculture? Recently, there's been a lot of noise in the media, and it does, hasn't really chimed with the reality on the ground. Next, I'd like to get into some of our uh, some of the particulars of our promotional work and our supply chain management, uh, including the upgrades that we put into the store this year. And finally, we'd like to finish with our goals for the rest of the year and our objectives going into 2021. Here's a little bit about who, who we are. Uh, Equus International is a business advisory and marketer located in China, established in 2007. I myself have been in China for over 20 years. Uh, the company specializes in promoting and bringing to market North American agri-food products. Basically the A to Z of trade and distribution to marketing and communications. Our supported products are found throughout the country, both online and offline, uh, in over 60 cities, having reached multi-million multi dollar sales. And we're also active in some of the adjoining markets, including places like Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia, among others. So many of you already know that the Georgia Pecan Growers Association has launched an online store on one of China's largest e-commerce platforms, which is JD.com. Uh, our role uh, really falls into two broad categories, one being marketing and the other being supply chain management. On the marketing side, our job is to market the store, drive traffic to the store, increase awareness of Georgia grown pecans, and achieve this basically through implementing a range of online and offline promotional activities. On the supply chain side, our work basically will revolve around import compliance, looking after the international shipping, monitoring domestic warehousing and delivery, and also ensuring customer satisfaction in this regard. I think it's important to highlight that no single complaint or issue that is ever addressed or put on the store, uh, whether it's a comment or a question, is left unaddressed. So um, any comment or any, any feedback uh, of a customer which is less than 100% uh, uh, satisfied, we will actually engage that customer and customer and make sure that they that their experience uh, is a positive one. One of the things that we're also doing for the short for the store and to help with the marketing is managing five social media platforms. This includes Weibo, which is the first one down at the bottom. That's basically Chinese Twitter. Uh, WeChat, which is basically a among other things, uh, a combination of Facebook and uh, WhatsApp rolled into one. 
every company and organization in China is on this platform, including the U.S. Embassy, consular, consular staff, um, and even several prominent U.S. politicians. Uh, next, we have Little Red Book. This is a lifestyle and food platform. This is where we also share things like recipes. Then you have Douyin, which is the black one at the bottom there. That's the Chinese equivalent of TikTok. This is basically for short videos, cooking demonstrations, basically making, if you pardon the pun, snackable con content for the younger demographic. Uh, this also is very similar to Billy Billy, which is a similar platform. These two platforms have been uh, um, added in 2020. So taking a moment to look at the market in China and what's been happening, of course, we're hearing a lot, uh, you know, in the news about China. Um, certainly there have been political tensions with China and the U.S. Uh, and Canada uh, and the EU and New Zealand and also Australia. Uh, however, there's been no fallout with consumers who still prefer imported products and see U.S. agriculture, agricultural goods as clean, safe, and healthy. I think also one of the challenges that we've had this year has been brought about by the pandemic. However, this has also created an opportunity in that this has driven more sales onto online platforms like Alibaba and JD.com. Uh, if we look at some of the numbers at the bottom, just in this short period from April to June, JD.com's annual customer base grew by 30 million, 30 million people to over 417 million users. I think also one of the key things that we're not hearing about is, in spite of all the noise about the trade war, a lot of the trade barriers and tariffs that have gone up uh, in the last few years due to the trade war have actually quietly been removed in, in, in 2020, including many audit requirements uh, which, were, which were in place only last year. Now, as we see that with the offline trade, I think then what's very interesting is Online trade has been totally unaffected. There were never any penalties introduced, nor have there been any uh, disruptions in that element of commerce for U.S. agricultural goods. I also think that if we take a moment to zoom out and look at the big, big picture, um, the macro environment for U.S. ag is looking very good. China has 20% of the world's population, 10% of, of, of the world's arable land. It also has acute water shortages. And to this, we have an, increase, an increasingly sophisticated consumer base, which are looking for clean, safe, imported goods. Um, many of them have traveled and want products which are authentic and healthy. If we start to break down China's food consumption into segments, tree nuts are one of the largest in the entire food category. And they are probably the largest if we look at the snack food category. Here we're looking at some numbers from November. Uh, of course, we look at November because that's peak season for online sales in China. That's when they hold uh, a range of different uh, promotional uh, promotional events, uh, similar to Black Friday in, in, in the United States. Um, many of you may have heard of Singles Day. Um, and if we look at the dollar amount, the, the retail value of the amount sold the amount of tree nuts sold on Alibaba was over $2.7 billion, and there was over $1.8 billion sold on JD.com. Finally, if we look at the 
year-on-year -year growth, we've got almost 17% growth uh, from the previous year. I think this year, when we, when we get to November 2020, we'll see uh, even higher numbers. Now, if we look at what some of the competitors are doing and one of the domestic in the domestic tree nut companies are, are doing in the market, I think we can see one innovation and two, this trend towards healthy snack, healthy snacking. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, domestic companies have be begun marketing is this concept of daily nuts, where your daily nuts are are, are almost like your daily minerals and vitamins, uh, marketed almost as supplements. And then they're, they're also marketed to children, to stressed out office workers, or even pregnant, pregnant women. The packages also are quite innovative as well, because if we look at some of the packaging, the the individual units that are in these boxes are actually quite small and they're also padded out with different types of dried fruit. So this helps create a perception of greater value uh, for the customer, even though you're getting them to buy more nuts in, in, in one single, single purchase. I think also it's worth noting that the search term daily nuts has been one of the hottest search terms um, for the snack food category in the last six months in China. Twenty nineteen, um, in a survey, these are the top ten factors that are uh, that Chinese consumers uh, uh, consider when choosing nuts. I think all of these play well to the Georgia Pecan Growers Association's over, over, growers' overall strengths. Uh, Georgia nuts um, are certainly superior to anything coming out of Mexico or out of South Africa. Again, the U.S. is well known for its uh, food, health, food safety standards. Um, I think one note though that I would mention is that even though packaging comes at the bottom uh, of, of the 10, it's still one of the major factors. So it is important to have eye-catching packaging. Um, I think packaging for retail, um, it's also, uh, if I'm going to put on my supply chain management hat on for a moment, it, it's important to have packaging which is resealable, um, whether that be a bag or jars or tins. Um, for the bags, certainly a nitrogen flush uh, helps. Um, bags that do not have transparent plastic also help. Um, you know, these things are all important for that long journey that the product's going to, going to have to take. Obviously, for some of the, the packaging that for nuts, which are in shell and going to be used for uh, home baking, you know, maybe not at quite as critical, but still it is, it is uh, important to have robust and robust packaging, which is, which is also eye-catching. So moving to some of the online promotional work that we've done, we've done several sampling uh, um, uh, campaigns and which then have resulted in over 185 posts with original content and videos from bloggers and uh, influencers, uh, KOL standing for key, of, key opinion leader. Um, and out of this, we've had some really interesting engagements, which we wouldn't, we might not have normally thought about, which one of them is this pairing of nuts with China's coffee culture. Uh, as many of you may already know, Starbucks is ubiquitous across China and coffee, co coffee culture has become a major trend. And some of the bloggers and influencers have, have zeroed in on this and, and now created food pairings you know, of the nuts with, with coffee. 
this is in addition to several recipe ideas um, and 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 other posts that that have gone that have gone up online. Now, as important as online promotion is, there's not everybody knows what a pecan is uh, in China, and there's still a little bit of confusion between pecans and uh, a domestic uh, hickory nut. This is a this is an issue which uh, everyone has faced in China, whether it's been the blueberry people or the cranberry people. Um, or even avocados. Uh, five years ago, there were really no avocados in, in China. But if you've noticed your local avocado price has gone up in the United States, one of the reasons is, is demand has exploded uh, in the Chinese market. And the same for blueberries and cranberries. Um, these were items which, you know, 10 years ago, if you were in China's interior, not everybody knew, knew what a blueberry was. So. As with the pecans, it's important that we get them in people's hands in offline events where they can taste the pecans and try them and then be taken along to a QR code, which will then take them to the uh, to the online store to to facilitate a purchase. Um, this includes events such as uh, different markets and fairs, but also things like cooking class sponsorships, Again, tapping into this home baking trend, which is which is starting to take place in, in many of the the uh, provincial capitals and major cities in, in, in China. In addition to our own digital marketing campaigns uh, and offline promotional work, we also try and leverage any existing partnerships we might have. For example, we keep an open conversation with U.S. pecans in both China and in Southeast Asia. And we look to see where we might be able to work together with them. U.S. pecans, of course, will be marketing pecan, U.S. pecans in a very generic sense. However, ultimately, when we look at the China market, the Georgia Pecan Growers Association store is one of the few places where consumers can go to actually buy the nuts that they've just learned about. Now getting into some of the nuts and bolts of the of the upgrades that we put into the store this year. One of the things we did was con commission entirely new uh, commercial photography, which was done in China. Um, this really helped kind of improve the, the look and feel of the store um, and also, I would just say that, you know, all of this commercial uh, photography is available to the growers um, if they wanted to use it for the U.S. or for other markets uh, in their own collateral, collateral or marketing materials. Here I've created a small video um, to kind of show, better show some of the upgrades that have gone into the, uh, in, in, into the uh, JD.com store. So I'm just going to hit play now. So one of the things we did was uh, replace all of the templated uh, images that JD.com had put in there. Um, now uh, the upgraded store, every, every image of the pecans is going to match exactly the packaging from, what it, from which it came from. So if a honey glazed nut is being mentioned, then uh, now, uh, honey glaze nut is what's going to be, uh, you know, appearing in the in the in the images. The other thing that we've done is we've completely uh, rewritten the the copy for all of the all of the different growers that are on the store. Um, you know, making sure that each grower's story is is unique and that all of their different skews and different Different varietals and flavors are highlighted on the on, on, on the store. Finally, one of the things we've tried to do is just make everything as easy and digestible for the viewer, so that they're very clear uh, on you know what they're buying and you know what are the what are the different attributes for each product. I'm pleased to say as well that we've had a newcomer uh, that we just added uh, recently. 
Um, for anybody who's interested, um, I think the you know the application time only involves about uh, four pieces of paperwork and a turn turnaround time of about uh, two and a half weeks. Um, so we put on purely pecans, uh, pecan butter and granola on the store. And we're very happy to have them, not only because the products are great and well suited to where the Chinese market is at this, at, at this time, but also because the more SKUs we have, the more searchable the store is. The more searchable the store is, the more visible it is, the more traffic that then goes to the store. So all of that information, including recipe ideas, help, help build our visibility. So we really also want to get even more products and more SKUs onto the store. Looking at our strategic objectives for the rest of the year and going into 2021, we've got four things we'd like to achieve. One, supply chain optimization. We're almost there, but there's still some minor things that need to be improved, although I'm confident that those will be tightened up by the end of this year. Two, continue to drive traffic and improve the overall store rating. Currently, our best record is 6,000 unique visitors in one month, looking at the store over 17,000 times. We want to build on that number. Next, increase our order conversions. And finally, launch new brands and new items on the store. As I mentioned before, that's critical to increasing the visibility uh, of, of, of the online store. And last, look for opportunities on other platforms and extend our reach. This year, I'm pleased that we've been able to expand our reach on two video platforms, but it would also be good to further this by then looking at smaller retail, regional retail online sales platforms, which will help our visibility. However, you don't have to take my word for it for some of the uh, for some of our activity here. I have all the QR codes for the different uh, um, platforms. The first one is JD.com, which is the store itself. If you take your cell phone, you'll be taken to the store by scanning that QR code. Next is, as I mentioned, Weibo, Chinese Twitter. Um, I think that's also a very good place to start because it's one of China's largest platforms. Um, and that will that will also give you a sense of all the different information, whether it's recipes, ideas, or stories about the different growers that are on the store, um, can all be found there. And then, as I mentioned before, there's WeChat, um, Red, and then the video platforms, which are Billy Billy and Douyin. Finally, if anybody has any questions or would like to get in touch, um, my email uh, address there is at the bottom, richard.morgan at egalimited.com. And you can also find out more about us on our website. Thank you very much. And I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Flint Ag and Turf, with eight full service locations in Southwest Georgia, is the leader in the market area with a full line of agricultural equipment and implements, including pecan harvesters, commercial scraper tractors, and irrigation systems. We also provide replacement parts for many popular tractors, like John Deere, Ford, Massey, and many more. Flint Ag and Turf has been a John Deere distributor for over 50 years and offers the kind of expertise, experience, and outstanding product support customers deserve. Think Flint first for your pecan equipment needs. Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Kruger, uh, MPSA Executive Director, um, coming to you from my home office in Decula, Georgia. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to present today to the Georgia Pecan Growers Association. Uh, I want to thank the board, uh, Samantha Lenny, for the opportunity to do this. Um, realize it's virtual, obviously, but uh, and much rather would do it in person, but still appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, present to you all, um, tell you a little bit about what NPSA has been up to over the past year or so. Uh, I want to start off talking about, um, or just reminding everyone about our mission just quickly. 
uh, NPSA's um, uh, mission is to support and promote the interest of pecan shellers in the global industry to assure the quality, safety, and integrity of pecan products worldwide. I um, want to kick things off here in this presentation uh, with a quick briefing on the uh, Pecan Chef Summit series, which has really become uh, pretty much the centerpiece of our marketing program these days. Uh, since 2015, this program has become really the industry's leading educational program for R&D chefs and commercial buyers. Uh, through it, we've elevated the understanding of and interest in pecans among commercial buyers and the food service industry. Uh, we have a lot of different um, channels represented at these events uh, over the years, uh, food service companies, hotels, universities, uh, major chain restaurants and airlines, just to name a few. Um, uh, quickly, I'm going to share with the group here a quick three minute video, uh, rather than just me talking and describing this event, I thought it might be helpful for you to see it um, firsthand. So bear with me just a minute. I'm going to pull it up here. We have some video on our website. Uh, this video recording is from um, uh, one of our recent events and you probably see some familiar faces in here, but I uh, definitely think it will give you a much better idea of how this event plays out in person. This is a whole new world in Pecan Land. I, I kind of think of it as kind of like an ordinary yacht that you can get extraordinary things from. Chef Summit. It's a really great way to highlight all the great pecan ingredients, such as pecan oil, pecan meal, pecan pizzas and halves. All these pecan oils and stuff that I haven't seen before. It's pretty exciting. So we're going to incorporate uh, some pecan oil and pecans into the cinnamon bar that I'm pretty famous for. <laughs> Me and my boss are fighting for this recipe. Because he's from Sweden, we do a Swedish cinnamon roll. We used to do ours uh, with the almond cinnamon filling. So I'm excited to see how it will be with the uh, pecan. The impact on the economy, if you get chefs buying Georgia pecans, is you know helping the whole state and helping our farmers. And then a large portion of what we and, and a lot of other companies do is business to business. We're seeing a lot of uh, interest in pecans lately um, just because of their health benefits, especially as things like the Mediterranean diet are uh, becoming a lot more popular. We're working on the stuffed eggplant and the pecans are going to add a crunch and a meatiness to make it more full bodied. You're going to get that really good pecan oil flavor and the mouthfeel and the texture from the pecans that you're looking for in a vegetarian dish. Because focus nowadays is a plant-based protein, and this really um, inspired me to look at simple, healthy plant protein. So versatile you can use in so many ways. It's something that I really enjoy it. Pecans have earned the check for Heart Smart Foods from the American Heart Association, and that's because they've been shown, of course, to help reduce the risk of heart disease. But that is in conjunction with an overall healthy diet. It's about providing those fresh those fresh items, local produce, healthy, sustainable, as much as possible. It's one of our biggest growing segments. Late late dining from 9 p.m. until we hours, and they want to be a little more healthy as well, more than just wings and pizza. Um, yeah. Just from the amazing things that were done here today with the pecan milk and the butter and just, it's endless what you can do. This Pecan Chef Summit, I have just found incredibly informative and really educational. And coming out here to see the whole beginning to the end of when they're shipped out, it's just amazing. I was just so excited to bring the chefs down where the action is. It's been a terrific experience from start to finish, really. Great camaraderie, great information. Meeting and talking with other chefs, learning from them. Being a part of the Pecan Chef Summit has really helped to, to broaden my understanding of pecans and inventive ways of using them as well. Inspiration to, to go back to my job and create new pecan recipes. I never knew I can do so many things with pecan. From what I learned, I want to take it back and use it in everything. Okay, uh, 
uh, there you go. Um, let me go back to the slideshow here. So these are just some of the major brands that have attended um, uh, our events over the past five years. Uh, at least these companies have sent at least one representative um, to uh, to participate. So you can see here, you've got some major players that have um, had this experience firsthand. Uh, just to drive it home a little bit more, these are some of the um, commercial applications that have been uh, developed as a result of the Chef Summit. Aramark and US Foods, uh, putting a new menu items, uh, putting out new menu items that include pecans, Morrison's Healthcare, uh, new patient menus featuring pecans, uh, UMass, uh, University of Massachusetts uh, dining program uh, where they uh, put together some new pecan recipes and uh, southernbite.com, which is a um, food blog, uh, had a representative at one of our events and they um, uh, are now consistently putting out recipes uh, that include pecans. So uh, again, just a sampling of how this, um, how this is a direct positive impact on the, uh, on the pecan market. I want to send out a, a big shout out and thank you to the American Pecan Council. Uh, it's their financial support that makes these events possible these days. Uh, in 2018 and 19, uh, we had Chef Summit events in Atlanta and San Antonio. Uh, this year we had a couple planned, but they unfortunately were postponed due to the COVID situation. So next year we do have two events scheduled and uh, hopefully uh, the health situation in the country will stabilize to the point where we can pull those off. Uh, I did want to thank um, some of the uh, NPSA members who had donated product uh, for these events as well for the recipe testing, the demos, and the gifts. So you can see those logos down there. Thank you all very much for that. Uh, in addition to the Chef Summit, we're uh, also uh, same audience, uh, food service, uh, commercial buyers, R&D chefs, but we're taking some other, other tactics or uh, using some other tactics as well. Uh, we put together an educational toolkit. You can see this here. This is available on our website to download. And also put together a food service newsletter, which again, targets the same audience, but hopefully is another touch point with this, uh, this newsletter is now going out quarterly. Um, this uh, late last year, uh, we tried to be opportunistic. This, this event wasn't in our plan, but we, uh, decided we were going to take a swing at it. Um, we were an in-kind, NPSA was an in-kind sponsor for the fifth annual Smithsonian Food History Weekend Gala in Washington, D.C. There were nearly 400 food innovators, entrepreneurs, chefs, and scholars at this event. And we had members that supplied pecans for the gift bags, which was a really good sampler program and just a great opportunity to showcase pecans in front of a, a you know, a target audience of, you know, several hundred um, uh, foodies. So outside of the marketing program, I wanted to touch on a couple of other projects uh, around research. One of them is our shelf life study. Uh, this is a university project now, now a university project to determine best storage and packaging practices for shell halves and in shell. Uh, we want to educate the industry to ensure that the consumer experience is satisfactory. This is, is great, actually. Um, we um, want to make sure that the pecans that are on the shelf um, and the consumers are buying are more or less in their prime, so to speak. And we wanted to get some um, actual uh, data to back that up. Uh, we're looking at, uh, at the University of Georgia, uh, now is where this project is. We're looking at rancidity development, moisture changes, uh, changes. Uh, physical changes and then using sensory evaluations while these products are stored at different storage conditions in a variety of different packaging types. So phase two is scheduled to begin in January of 2021, this coming up January at the University of Georgia. Dr. Ron Pegg and his team are heading this effort up and the testing is going to be over 24 months. Uh, this project is also funded by the American Pecan Council, so would be remiss if I uh, didn't give them some credit and a, a big thank you for that, for making this possible. Uh, another project, uh, this is also at the University of Georgia um, with a slightly different uh, tact here. Uh, this is more of a technology engineering project. We're calling it our shelling engineering project. 
Uh, our objectives here are to uh, improve or, or seek and identify improved and alternative sanitation and cleaning methods uh, and more efficient cracking and shelling technology. Specifically, we're looking at identifying alternatives to PPO uh, on the uh, sanitation cleaning side. Uh, and we're also uh, on the cracking and shelling technology. We want to um, come up with a, uh, a blueprint for, um, for equipment that, or, or technology that will um, reduce the uh, yield of have, uh, sorry, reduce the yield of pieces and increase the yield of halves. Uh, we also want to do this, obviously, with a decrease in maintenance, downtime, parts, and associated costs. So uh, with the help of the uh, National Pecan Federation, we were able to secure $1.5 million in USDA ARS appropriations funding for this project for 2021. At uh, UGA, we have uh, two um, of their uh, uh, divisions involved with this, the College of Agricultural and Environmental Science and the College of Engineering. And uh, we're doing this uh, in, in an integrated way. The, the research team is doing this in an integrated way uh, so that um, the food safety, food science, and um, engineering goals uh, are blended. And hopefully that will help us come up with an innovative uh, approach here that um, potentially, uh, you know, we'll see, I don't want to get too uh, ahead of myself, but uh, could potentially be a, a real game changer for the industry in a few years when this project is complete. Last thing I wanted to mention, um, you may have heard uh, last week that the USDA is purchasing pecan pieces uh, on the open market. And uh, this is a direct result of a, uh, an effort that came together last summer between the NPSA, the APC, and the NPF. Uh, these uh, Our three organizations partnered uh, to petition USDA last summer for a buy like this. Uh, and last week it was announced that the USDA is planning to purchase $40 million of pieces from the U.S. market. Uh, this is going to be through the USDA Section 32 program. So the purchases are going to supply federal food and nutrition programs, school lunches, and food banks, things like that. Uh, which is good. Obviously, there's a need there, uh, particularly this year and probably going into next year, too, with the COVID-19 situation being such a um, having such a negative impact on families um, and institutions across the country. Uh, but we're also um, pleased that this purchase will help clean up uh, the oversupply of undervalued pieces that are out there on the market today. So, you know, it's going to help going to uh, certainly help the pecan industry as well. Uh, so that's all I had today. Um, again, want to say thank you. Ask everyone to stay safe. Um, again, I wish we could be together in person. Um, we're under the same pressures here. Our, our annual meeting had to be canceled. Um, next week, we're actually doing the first virtual meeting. So it's uh, just something that all, um, all organizations that put on meetings are dealing with this year. So hopefully, uh, again, things will stabilize here sometime soon, and we'll all be able to get together in person, hopefully starting in 2021. So until then, stay safe. Thanks a lot, and uh, take care. More than 50 years ago, a young man in southern Oklahoma dreamed up a machine that any farmer with a tractor could use to shake pecans out of his trees. This seed grew into a company that became the premier manufacturer of pecan equipment in the world. Savage Equipment still makes tree shakers, along with a couple dozen other machines that support every aspect of the pecan business around the world. Savage Redline provides everything you need for growing and harvesting pecans. Gray Line includes all the machines you need to assemble a world-class pecan cleaning operation. And the stainless steel silver line has become the industry standard for pecan processing. It's been quite a journey since young Basil Savage crafted that first tree shaker, and you can learn more about it at savageequipment.com. Finally today I'm going to try to give you an update of uh, what's currently going on with the pecan market. Uh, there's a lot of um, issues that we face out there right now and there's a lot of concern out there in the market right now and I just want to 
touch on some of those things and, and hopefully try to better explain some of what's going on to help you understand more about it as we move into the harvest season. I've shown this slide before at a number of uh, presentations and it just kind of shows the different problems that we currently face in, in our industry. Of course, we've got the tariffs. We've just recovered from a major storm. Um, domestic demand has been low. Uh, there's still some issues, even though demand is up. Um, the supply that's out there it can be a problem at times. Uh, probably our biggest problem is the Mexico crop. I'll touch on that. Um, cost of production is always an issue. We've now got COVID on top of everything else and, and the South African crop that plays into this as well. So here's what the traditional pecan marketing system has historically looked like. Um, if you go back to before China was a, a factor, uh, basically the grower sold to the accumulator. The accumulator then sold to the sheller or sometimes to gift pack markets. Uh, the sheller you know, sold to, to all of these. And that was pretty much the, the chain of, of supply and how the, the marketing system worked. And in that scenario, the sheller pretty much held most of the cards uh, and pretty much determined price. After China came into the market in 2007, the, the landscape shifted a little bit there. Uh, because China was buying primarily in shell pecans, that gave an opportunity for the grower uh, to benefit directly from sales to China. Um, so the grower had that option. The grower also sold to the accumulator, who then sold to China, which still benefited the grower greatly. Um, and then accumulators still sold to shellers. Uh, and to gift packers and, and the shellers still sold to their, their normal customers as well. So digging a little deeper into uh, just how much the China market uh, affected uh, pecans here, especially in Georgia. Uh, if you look at the cost of production back in 2002, our cost of production was a little, was around $850 an acre. Uh, by 2008, uh, fuel prices, of course, had gone up and everything went up and the cost of production jumped up there to around 1,500 pounds an acre. But um, during this same period, you know, the price of pecans only rose by about 27 cents per pound. 2004, uh, there were only about 2 million pounds of, of pecans exported to China. 2007, uh, for the first time, the price of pecans fell below that of walnuts, and that's really what got pecans into the Chinese market. Uh, China that year bought 47 million pounds of, of U.S. pecans. That was three times the number they bought in 2006, so it was a huge thing for the, the market. Uh, 2009, China bought 80 million pounds of pecans, which was about a quarter of the U.S. crop. Um, and so as a result, what we tended to see was that by 2011, the average price for pecans was 243 a pound, which was a record for, for a new record for three years in a row that was set. Um, and, you know, basically it amounted to an increase of about a dollar per pound paid to the grower compared to the pre-China market. So this benefited growers greatly. So let's now look at what happened uh, in 2018. So when the tariffs came on board, uh, we had the trade issues with China that we still currently have. Um, that pretty much cut out that market to China. So the grower and the accumulator both um, pretty much were not able to sell to China as, as we had been. Um, accumulator still could sell to the sheller, uh, although at much reduced prices, and that pretty much resulted in a price drop of about 77 cents per pound for the grower, uh, put the sheller kind of back uh, holding all the cards when it comes comes to uh, determining price, and, and that's kind of currently uh, still where we are at this time.
But there's been even a, another wrinkle put into this, uh, and that is Mexico. Um, Mexico is one of our biggest problems uh, as far as uh, pricing for the domestic uh, U.S. grower. Um, Mexico, and we'll talk more about this in, in a little bit, is, you know, they sell to the accumulator, they sell to the sheller. Um, and this compounded uh, with the fact that China is still, a, uh, there's still issues getting nuts to China. We saw a little bit better movement last year, um, but there are some, some issues currently there. Um, and China drives 20% of the global demand uh, for pecans. So uh, they're a big customer, and we really need them uh, at this point. That's no secret to anybody. Um, and I'll talk more about Mexico in just a minute. But again, in this situation, the sheller still holds most of the cards uh, as it comes to pricing, but mainly because of the supply they have coming in from Mexico. Growers used to combat uh, some of these price problems by storing nuts. Um, that has now become a bigger gamble than it used to be. Um, because there's such a large supply out there now uh, coming from Mexico but not but also from South Africa and because South Africa is in the southern hemisphere their crop comes off uh, about June May or June is when they start to harvest um, so that gives us only about a six month window to move the nuts that we have stored uh, at, at better prices than we sometimes may see in the fall. Um, so it complicates that issue as well of knowing when to store and, and if that's going to work out or not. Now, it's no secret uh, about all the nuts that are flooding into the U.S. from Mexico. Um, and Mexico is now... Uh, probably a larger producer of pecans than the U.S. Um, so they have right now, well, this, these numbers are from 2015. It's, it's going to be up from that. Uh, but in 2015, we were looking at 278,000 acres of pecans in Mexico. They've been adding about 10,000 new acres each year. So now they're probably up over 300,000 acres of pecans. Uh, 2015, uh, they were, were they produced 270 million pounds of pecans. Uh, that also has gone up, and so they are now probably producing 300 million pounds or more. They probably outpace the U.S. as far as production, and they're capable of supplying about half the world's supply of pecans. So they they are a major player in this now. And this is why I try to keep trying to emphasize to growers that, that it no longer really matters just how big the crop is in Georgia. Um, that used to be a big player in the, on determining price in the market. But uh, with Mexico being so big now, the size of the crop in Georgia doesn't necessarily matter so much. Um, not as much as it used to anyway. And so when U.S. shellers bring in pecans from Mexico, what they're bringing over is mainly Wichita and Western Sly. Wichita and Western Sly make about a 52% kernel or better. Uh, and, of course, there's going to be some stuff that's not that good being brought in from Mexico, but there's going to be plenty that, that's decent, you know, good percent kernel. Um, and so basically there's an unlimited supply of this coming in from Mexico. Um and that makes it very difficult for us because with this situation, um, if you talk to a lot of grow or a lot of buyers, uh, you know the the feeling that you get from them is that there's really no longer a place for much less than a fifty percent nut in the domestic shellers market, um, and that's a big problem for us in Georgia because I would say that probably at least half of our crop and probably more, may fall into this category because of all the old trees 
that we have and old varieties that are out there. Yes, we have a lot of um, young production, a lot of new trees in there that are newer varieties that are producing much better percent kernel and quality than that, but we still have a lot of this old these old varieties and old orchards out there that are producing, in all honesty, uh, a lower percent kernel than what you see from a Wichita Western Sly. Um, now, there may be a potential market out there for these nuts. Um, you know, sometimes percent kernel may not matter so much to a consumer as long as the kernel looks nice. Um, but the percent kernel in that nut affects the sheller being able to uh, shell that when you're competing with a, a much higher percent kernel nut. Um, so there may be a potential market out there for these nuts, but it may not necessarily be the traditional uh, sheller's market that we've known in the past. Now, in 2019, even though we had tariffs, uh, tariff situation still in place, um, we did see more pecans moving to China uh, indirectly and directly, and that did help uh, bolster prices a little bit for the grower last year over what we saw in 2018. Of course, it still wasn't up to what we saw prior to the tariffs, and I don't know that we will get back there. Uh, it was an improvement and, and it was for, for many growers they were able to get profitable prices if they had a crop to sell um, but some of the issues uh, regarding that may have changed um, recently uh, we, there were some buyers that were arrested uh, in China and these weren't just they didn't just buy pecans, they were, were nut buyers, uh, pistachios, almonds, walnuts, uh, pecans too, um, that were, were buying nuts, but uh, they were also smuggling nuts into China and got caught. And uh, so it was a pretty big operation there, uh, and, it, and it shut down a lot of the buyers. Um, there are still buyers in place there that, that can buy um, but they definitely have to deal with the tariff situation and and uh, this does present another issue for us this year now there's no question that the in shell market is a great benefit to growers but without that in shell market to china growers lose a lot of leverage in the market as far as price goes um, and we have to ask the question as we go forward how much in shell marketing uh, is there going to be done uh, by the industry um, and I'll get more into this in just a minute but uh, Western growers tend to be less affected uh, by the influx of Mexican crop into the US uh, they're still affected uh, but probably to a lesser extent than we are here in the southeast because the cultivars they grow uh, in the west are pretty much the same cultivars grown in Mexico uh, and their yield per acre is, is higher than we produce here because of their sunlight and the vigor of their trees with such a uh, with hedging being employed uh, so much there um, and the age of their trees is younger in general uh, all that helps to, to bump their yields up a little higher than what we have here in the southeast um, but again they're growing the same varieties that Mexico is growing and it's a lot easier for the shellers to fit that into their operations if they're bringing that same uh, variety those same varieties up from Mexico too um, so as a result the domestic shellers really appear to have moved away from or are moving away from the old Georgia blends that we have and that's just a shift of in the market in the traditional market and there's not a lot we can do about that uh, from our perspective uh, of, of these old varieties and old trees uh, going on in that traditional market um, one of the issues out there that's always been an issue is that 
sellers have a hard time moving pieces and and the question comes up why and i think the the you know the real answer to that is just is there's such a large volume of that stuff out there um and when the, the price of pieces drop uh shellers tend to panic and the bottom falls out of the market and and that's kind of you know some of the things that go on with that i think one thing we have to keep in mind uh as growers is that as we plant new trees we have to be growing better quality nuts with more uniformity uh and or a lower cost of production uh when we can to compete on the domestic market and we have to develop new markets now that's not necessarily something that's easy to do but i think it's something we need to look into um also we have to implement hedging uh on a, on a wider scale, and, and I do see more and more hedging going on in orchards, um, but I think we have to implement this tool to keep trees more vigorous and productive in order to maintain consistent yield with better varieties going forward. Another issue, Another issue that we have uh, is that the USDA basically wants a unified industry at all costs and I know many growers have a big problem with shellers being a part of the APC board and to an extent that is certainly understandable um, but because USDA has oversight of the marketing order um, that is why uh, we have to have shellers on the board it's required by USDA uh, as part of a unification of the industry um, but that does not change the fact that at times it may be difficult to get a consensus uh, within the whole industry and certainly within APC for some of the things that benefit mainly southeastern growers. And I think that's where some of our issues uh, arise. Um, it's just a simple fact that Scheller's interests, and to a lesser extent probably uh, that of the Western growers, uh, do not always align with the interests of Southeastern growers. An example of that, of course, is the in-shell market. The Southeastern growers um, probably benefited more than the rest of the industry from the strong in-shell market that we saw uh, before the, the China tariffs. It seems to me that since we are the ones that benefit most from this in shell market and the enhanced prices that we um, as Georgia growers I think we should be continuing those efforts on our own behalf um, regardless of the direction APC or other segments of the industry take I think it's critical for us as the, the Georgia pecan industry um, specifically growers to work on keeping and growing those in shell markets specifically overseas now just for clarification I want to kind of do a sidebar here and, and talk some about the American Pecan Council and US Pecan Growers Council and, and kind of define what those entities are I think most people probably know but there may be some out there that don't um, the American Pecan Council um, manages the federal marketing order um, which is the money that is generated uh, when you go to sell your your pecans so three cents per pound for improved varieties and two cents per pound uh, for seedlings is paid into the uh, federal marketing order which American Pecan Council uh, manages and again, and I can't emphasize enough uh, the importance of the oversight by USDA uh, of these funds. USDA basically determines what the APC can and cannot do with this money. Um, the board of the APC is made up of growers, three growers, two shellers, uh, and two at-large members and alternates from each region of the U.S. Um, where pecans are grown. Now, there's a little bit of uh, 
controversy depending on who you ask about this next statement. Um, but I think that everyone that attended the meetings when the federal marketing order was being promoted um, understood that the original intent uh, of the APC was as a tool to improve domestic promotion and research. Uh, you can look back in the testimony of the people that testified uh, on behalf of the, the marketing order uh, prior to its implementation, and that's what they, their statements in the hearing were, that, that we needed to do this to improve, to get better domestic promotion and research. And that's kind of how it was sold to the industry. Um, the American Pecan Council uh, has done some, some good things for the industry. Uh, I wanted to highlight some of these. Uh, it, it funded a study to quantify phosphite residues in pecans. That was a big issue as we tried to move pecans into the EU because the EU had set um, very, very low tolerances for that. Um, and the APC funded a study to quantify that. And actually, it ended up getting those tolerances raised for pecans so that we could continue to move nuts to the EU. So that was very beneficial. It has recently funded a pecan shelf life study, uh, which I think is one of the key things that we need to work on as an industry uh, to be able to market nuts um, because the shelf life of pecans is one of the main drawbacks uh, as far as keeping pecans on the shelf and getting consumers to buy them. Um, APC also uh, funded a satellite mapping study uh, of the pecan acreage in the U.S. that gave a better picture of exactly how many acres of pecans there are out there. Um, it is in the process now of developing a voluntary quality assurance program. Uh, the idea there is that um, you would be able to enroll your acreage into this program and basically it would state that that you just grow uh, according to the best management practices that are out there uh, which most growers probably already do anyway um, but the key there is that this would be a way of separating um, perhaps the Mexican nuts or imported nuts uh, from US grown nuts and so any nuts that have that stamp or seal that would be made available to them through this quality assurance program would not be able to bl be blended uh, with Mexican nuts or any nuts that did not have that seal. Um, and so that is a good thing. We do want to make sure that, that those best management practices are uh, suitable for each of the growing regions and possibly may even need to be a little different for each growing region depending on the environment and practices that are in place there and the needs of the industry from the growers perspective uh, in, in those parts, different parts of the country. APC also uh, developed a marketing deal with iHeartRadio and IMG networks that, that was uh, reached a lot of people. Um, and domestic, they've shown domestic consumption is up 33, was up 33.5% in one year. And domestic consumption since the FMO was put into place is up uh, a little over 12%. Now, this looks good, but also the issue there is that a lot of that domestic consumption is being filled with the nuts that are brought in from Mexico which is a concern for a lot of U.S. growers. Um, but that's an issue that's going to be difficult to tackle and figure out how to handle um, going forward. I don't think it's an issue that's going to be going away, and it's something we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with. Now, a recent... APC survey shows that only two out of ten Chinese consumers have knowledge of pecans. Um, and if that holds true, especially if those ten consumers surveyed uh, are all 
coming from the Chinese middle class, then yes, that does represent a huge opportunity for growth still in China. Um, keep in mind that China's middle class population, which is the primary consumer of pecans there, uh, is less than one-third of the country's population. Um, APC uh, states that they are planning to reach out to states going to China uh, to see how APC may partner uh, in order to reach more consumers in the future. Um, and they do state that this concept is to assist in promoting both in-shell and kernel markets. So this is another reason I think Georgia itself needs to take the reins on some of this and then partner with APC uh, and, and also U.S. Pecan Growers Council as the opportunity arises. Now, as you can tell, we have a lot of organizations within the pecan industry, and that's one of the issues out there. Um, the U.S. Pecan Growers Council is an organization that has been around for a while. It is made up of growers from each region, and this is the group that helped to build the Chinese export market, and there are those out there who would question that statement, um, but there's no question that during the time the U.S. Pecan Growers Council was heavily working in China, that the demand rose there. Um, so the, the two coincided. U.S. pecans were certainly keeping pecans visible over there. Um, and U.S. Pecan Growers Council was the first group to get MAP funding for pecan export marketing back in 2010. And since that time, uh, so from 2010 to 2019, they were able to secure over $7 million in funding for export marketing. And this program, uh, the Market Access Program is what MAP stands for, um, and it was held up by the USDA's Foreign Ag Service as one of the top success stories uh, for that MAP program. Um, so it was very successful um, and, and had a good record and a lot of support within the industry. So in further effort to uh, unify try to unify the industry and kind of having everything under one umbrella in the form of APC, USDA awarded uh, the MAP funding for 2020, which was over $630,000, to APC. And uh, APC contracted with U.S. Pecan Growers Council to handle the marketing for Asia for 2020. APC was going to handle the rest of the, the world. Um, and it's important to recognize that APC's International Marketing Committee are the ones that do make the decisions on how specifically that money is spent. Now, because of COVID, which changed many things, um, a lot of the efforts that U.S. Pecan Growers Council had proposed uh, were, were not really doable. Uh, with COVID around. Um, so APC shifted some of these funds to hire the Weber Shanwick uh, company to do um, some in-country representation for, for pecans in China. And uh, they have, you know, APC has applied for 2020 and 2021 MAP funding um, for the coming year with a total international budget of nearly $2 million. Um, now, going forward, it's important to recognize that um, that in-shell market that we desperately need uh, for, for our crop here in Georgia is really dependent upon uh, the APC's International Marketing, Marketing Committee uh, to support that. Um, and it's one thing to do social media uh, work over there and generate more awareness for pecans, and that's great, and we certainly need that. Um, but we don't need to run into a similar situation that we have here 
in the U.S. to where we generate all this uh, awareness of pecans, and then you have buyers or, or people that want pecans and don't know where to get them. So I think it's still very important that we continue these trade missions, um, inbound and outbound trade missions, uh, where we send people over there, and then we also bring buyers from other countries over here to meet with um, accumulators, uh, shellers, growers, whoever has pecans to sell. Um, so, so that's critical because they, they really need, they want to know where they can find pecans, and we need to provide them with that opportunity. So what, what can we do at this point? Um, there's a few things we need to, to keep in mind here. Um, I think the biggest thing, and this, this would go for domestic or international marketing, is that we need to do some of this marketing ourselves, and we need to work together as Georgia growers. Um, there's a lot of good things that have happened here recently. Um, recently, we have been given a, a size classification of pecans called Georgia Grand, which is a little above that of the, the mammoth halves. Um, so it would be larger nuts than a mammoth half. Um, basically nuts that would be, you know, for, for us talking in grower terms, uh, 50 count nut uh, with a, you know, around a 52% kernel or so. Uh, we classify somewhere around, that may not be the exact numbers, but that's it's somewhere close to that for Georgia Grand. Um, we also need to brand Georgia pecans and get the awareness of the large pecans and the varieties that we grow and the benefits of those, we need to get that information out there. Um, we need to develop new markets domestically. I still believe that, that is, there's a huge market here in the U.S. that's not being touched. Um, and we could do that, you know, possibly with shell and certain, um, certainly with possibly within shell. Um, but that's not really an easy thing to do. There's a lot of a lot of things that go into that, and I'm not going to really go into all that right here. That would be a, a, a huge goal, I think, for the industry and a huge accomplishment, but it's not going to be an easy one. It's going to be a long road. Um, and if, if, you know, we're selling things in that type of market that are not necessarily the things that the shellers want it shouldn't alienate them uh, because it's not the varieties that they want anyway um, I think one of the biggest things that we can do um, is that we should support this in shell marketing work that the US Pecan Growers Council started um, what I am going to you know uh, promote is that, that the Georgia Pecan Growers and, and Association and the Georgia Commodity Commission for Pecans um, should both work together to prior, prioritize in-shell marketing of Georgia pecans overseas because there's no question in anybody's mind that the in-shell market is where growers benefit most and I think we need to keep that going. And if we're the ones to benefit from that, then we need to be the ones that step up and, and take charge of it and, and seek to do this ourselves. The inbound and outbound trade missions that I mentioned earlier, I think, are critical to this. Some people don't like them. I see them as a good way to get more buyers connected to suppliers. Um, we can continue to do this in China, of course, as, as COVID abates and hopefully and, uh, and the trade situation changes. I think China still needs to be a major market. Taiwan, uh, the Georgia Department of Agriculture and Commissioner Black, uh, through with a partnership with SUSTA last year, set up a, a really good program with Taiwan that, that had some benefit for those that participated. Um, Dubai is another 
uh, place I think that could be focused on and talking with growers and, and people that have been uh, over there. Um, that looks like it's a good market to India and possibly uh, being able to bring them in there even even in the face of the, some of the tariff situations we have directly with the U.S. and, and India. Um, and India would be a huge market if we could get into there. So I think that's another one we really need to be working on. Um, as opportunity arises, we can invest in hiring consultants and people on the ground in some of these overseas countries to, to help promote Georgia pecans in those countries. Um, and ultimately, certainly, Georgia Pecan Growers Association, the Commodity Commission for Pecans, and Georgia's Department of Agriculture, um, all working together um, in partnership with SUSTA, which uh, I don't have time to go into here, but it's a great, uh, great way to to help promote our products overseas, um, and then also. Uh, be open to partnering with APC and also U.S. Pecan Growers Council if and when uh, the opportunity arises. So uh, just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what's going on with the industry from the market standpoint right now. Um, and so there's a lot of complications and a lot of complex issues going on within the industry. Um, and hopefully that shed some light on some of it. Um, but if you got any questions, uh, just let me know. Thanks. Thank y'all for being here. I hope that what you saw today would be very beneficial to you and that you'll be able to use it and take it and go with it and learn some things. And just remember that our staff is here for your very benefit. For Samantha and her staff, that there are a lot of things that you can learn if you'll just call, check in with her and that she'll be able to help you with a, with a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of things that have gone on that are just beneficial into this industry. And I just know that if we come together in this association, if we pull together as one, that we'll be able to overcome all the obstacles that we're dealing with. And we know that farming always has obstacles, but that's, that's not unusual for each and every one of you because you've already seen that. But if we pull together in one accord, that, that's, that we can overcome these obstacles. And that's what this association is about, is to help you, to encourage you, to give you ideas and give you possibilities. And I just pray that you will do that and take, take advantage of the, what you've, uh, Samantha and them are putting together. For they're there for your per benefit and your purposes. And that's what we want you to do, is take advantage of that. And thank you again for being here. Thank you.